Welcome to Backpacker Radio, presented by The Trek. I am your co-host, Zach Badger-Davis. Sitting to my right is... Hi, I'm Juliana Chauncey, a.k.a. Chaunce. I forgot to look up the holiday of the day. Hold on, I'll do oh, that quickly. Oh, we can do that quick. Yeah. Um, Say something cool in the meantime. Sarah, this would be a fun one to pull a clip of like pre-recording banter, uh, just so people can get a behind the scenes of how much fun we have before we hit record. We so had, we had a couple fun <coughs> things in there. So the obvious one is apparently today's Labor Day. <laughs> Actually, today is Labor Day. Yeah. No. I, I mean, today people are listening to this on September fourth. Oh, got yeah. it, got yeah. it, got we're, it. We're time yes. traveling a little okay. bit. T- today is September fourth. I'm in Vermont today. This is fantastic. Nice. Cool. I'm enjoying the foliage. I'm having a lovely time. It's not hot where you are. You don't need air conditioning. Nope. My AC has long been repaired. Yeah, but let's. N- Ignore that it's Labor Day and uh, celebrate the fact that today, September 4th, is also Eat an Extra Dessert Day. I love that. <laughs> I, I mean, there's nothing else to comment. I will be eating extra dessert today. Yep. Uh, quick couple of reminders before we get to our interview that the Pooping in the Woods submission form is live and wanting your guys' submissions real bad. Chance? Um, I've been reading all the submissions and kind of flagging them on good, great, not so great. Um, there haven't been many not so greats. Most of them have been really good. I was reading some this weekend, uh, getting caught up, and there's ones where someone has been in full on squat mode, and they look up and they see a mountain lion, and then they like a start to panic, b panic, and they start backing up and they turn around and there's a second mountain lion behind them. Oh, Jesus. Um, the submissions we're getting are unreal. I've gotten. One of the stories was someone walking up onto a shitting circle where three people have been holding hands in a squat, shitting together. And what is strange is that is not a story that was submitted by Scuba Steve, who had also told us a story of walking upon the same type of circle in his episode. So this is like a thing for some culture? I don't even know. This could be a whole spinoff is... Finding the cult that shits in circles. Okay. If you had to draft your shit circle team, who are you going with? Oh, man. This is like a triple <laughs> crown of people I'd be shitting with. Ah, <laughs> uh, Definitely not. Well, I would want to put a boy in there because I'd want to see what your dangly bits do when you're in that kind of a squat. <laughs> oh, you know, Jesus. like, I don't know. I think I'd just be interesting to see a different angle. Um, but a also, angle. I want a boy that's not like. You have to a, pick a boy. It's, it can't be like a job. I don't want here. someone who's yeah. going to smell. I want someone with cute little doe poops, you know, like little deer pellets. I'm, so you're picking your boyfriend here, right? No, his poop smells really bad. It's, you're picking a guy. Someone's shit's going to stink. Maybe who am I very close with? Follow-up question. Is Garrett going to get jealous when you pick a guy who is not He him? really shouldn't. <laughs> Even though I mentioned because I want to look at their penis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to pick an all-girl team. Yeah. I'll shit with Mims. <laughs> um, Fireball makes my roster. I'll toss Weezer on there. I feel like she probably has very earthy poops because she eats really well. Nice. So girl stuff poop circle coming yeah. coming to you in, in woods nearby. Yeah. Wait, now who's in, who's in your poop circle? <clears throat> um... Well, we're going through potty training with my son right now, uh, and I would like for that to finish. So I'm going to pick him because if he's in my team, that means he's evolved to the non-diaper life. And then I'll just pick the other two boys because they'll feel left out otherwise. It's so unfair to be able to choose your offspring. Yeah, it's the only advantage, literally the only advantage that I have right now. I'll give it to you. But yeah, if you guys have an amazing backcountry poop story, we would love to include it in our forthcoming book release date tbd um if you want to get involved head to the show notes we have a link for you to submit that also you've heard this in ads before but if you're one of those that skip ads don't do that chance and i are going on a adventure trip in iceland of summer next year and you get to join us Mm -hmm. july 2024 that's right we have a limited amount of early bird spots which you can save a couple hundred bucks Um, But basically, we're going to be exploring fjords, glaciers, waterfalls. We're going to be going out to nice dinners and just exploring the beautiful countryside that is Iceland. Honestly, I couldn't be more excited for this. Um, Iceland's been a place that I've been wanting to go to for a very long time. And this is going to be awesome. 
Yeah, I love the idea of someone curating a trip for us that is fully planned out and we don't need to do any of the logistics. Yeah. And I also think the group size is very approachable. For sure. Because it's not going to be so many people that we can't like hang out and talk to each one. It's going to be like a little close knit like hiker fam group. That's right. So including Chance and I, the group will be anywhere between 12 and 16. Um, so a, a little tight knit family. If you want to yeah. get involved with that, again, the link for more information will be available in the show notes. If you do want to do this, I highly encourage you to sign up sooner rather than later because one, the early bird spots and two, the group size is limited. So I'll uh, toss on three payment installments are always a fun way to do a trip. Yep. Okay beating around the bush no more let's get right to our interview with gillian larson is a long distance through rider gillian has ridden more than ten thousand backcountry wilderness miles including two through rides of the pacific crest trail the cdt the arizona trail and the colorado trail gillian was the youngest person to solo through ride the pct in 2014 became the first person to through ride both the pct and the cdt thank you so much for joining us here on backpacker radio Thank you. Thank you for having me. Oh, learning I need to get your volume a little oh, bit higher. Just kidding. There we go. Thank you for having me. Yeah, you know, <laughs> very happy to have you. Uh, this is one we've been wanting to get on for a long time. Tell us about your background with horses. What got you into uh, the activity, hobby, sport? I don't even know how you classify horses. Life consuming. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Something like that. Yeah. Lifestyle seems appropriate. Let's go the horse yeah. lifestyle. The horse life. Hashtag uh, horse life. Definitely my mom's fault. She was uh, got into it herself when she was like 12 years old. She got her first horse and has never been without like horses in her life, as far as I'm aware. Um, so she was bringing me to the barn when I was like in diapers, basically, and hmm. you know would take me around to feed the horses carrots. Um, she leased a pony for me to start riding when I was like four years old. And she would like be doing her fancy show lessons and I'd be like put putting around on this like little white pony named Stoney. Um, and that's definitely, I think like what kind of like got me hooked on it was I just liked adventuring around by myself on my little pony. Um, I definitely enjoyed that part. I was never very much into the whole show thing. Never have done a competition. Was That was not my jam, especially watching my mom do a lot of, you know, the time and effort it took. And it was always in the arena setting. I, that was just never what captivated me. I think from very early on, because she was letting me basically go off by myself at like four years old on this pony around. It was a very big barn. It was, um, gosh, it must have been like over 100 acres. Like it was a pretty big facility. And so she felt fine for whatever reason about letting me just roam the vicinity with my pony. So I think that was just once once I had a little taste of that freedom, I was you were never going to get me into a show ring. <laughs> it was that door was closed. Did she ever try to nudge you into competitions? No, she didn't. I was it's kind of surprising that she was never the type of mom that was going to like force me to take lessons. Like she signed me up for lessons after like the pony. I took lessons like maybe once a week or something for, I don't think all that long. It's hard to remember back to when you're five. Yeah. Um, but I took lessons for a little while and then she got me a horse when I was seven. And pretty much once I got the horse, then the only riding I would do was like twice a week with her and we'd just go on trail rides together. Cause that was what I was interested in doing. And she like leased out a horse so she could go riding on trails with me and not take her like fancy show horse out on the trails. So she was very accommodating. And that's definitely been like my mom's like theme to parenting is just like, you know, let the kid kind of like pick what like interests them and then just, you know, like be the sidekick and like help them, you know, figure out like what is their passion. So my mom was really good about that. She said that she never forced me really into anything. And she was always very accepting of waiting until I like made the self decision to like start something new or want to try something new. Or if I was trying something new and I didn't like it, like it was okay to stop doing it. Like there was never this you said you were gonna stick with it, you need to stick with it. Yeah, she was very chill for a parent. It's funny because so many people's parents get very anxious slash nervous when they say they wanna go onto a through hike. Was your mom stoked that you declared you wanted to become a through rider? I don't think stoked would be the word <laughs> I would use for it. Um, I, she was definitely nervous, especially too, cause it was like somewhat out of the blue. Like she had been, reading about um Anish and like her PCT record mm -hmm. in like the LA Times and then she and I were out in like this little short three-day trip to a high Sierra camp 
um, on the High Sierra Trail at Bear Paw Meadow. And so we weren't even like truly backpacking. We didn't have like a stove. We didn't have a tent. We just had like clothes in our bag and some toiletries and we were just gonna stay in the cabin. So it was very like cush backpacking trip. So I'd never even like slept on a true backpacking trip before starting the trail. But anyhow, she's telling me about like Anish's hike and like the part that like blew my mind was the fact that there even was a trail that existed like that. And so I pretty much declared while we were out there with like no cell reception, I was like, if this trail is open to horses, I'm doing it. <laughs> and so I think she was like thinking that was very like, kind of like an ignorant, quick statement to make when I had no facts about anything to just declare that I was going to do something with like no knowledge. So I think from the beginning, she was trying to have more of the, like the realist perspective and like keep me a little bit more grounded on earth of like, okay, well, you know nothing about camping outside. You know nothing about like riding horses in the back country. You know nothing about the Pacific Crest Trail. Like, you know, you need to like do your due diligence. Mm -hmm. So she was, she was definitely trying to be that parent in that moment of like, you know, supportive, not telling me to not do it, but also making sure that I was like be not safe. totally flying off the handle. Yeah, yeah. Right. She was so supportive though, because yeah. I definitely like, dragged her into that first adventure and yeah. like kind of consumed her summer that summer. So yeah. she was amazing. Do you have siblings? I do not. No. Which is probably why I was able to consume her, <laughs> her summer because it's just me. Yeah. I mean, that isn't, that isn't even why I asked. I was curious to know if you're, if you did have siblings, if they were as into horses as you, but that's a null and void question. Um, <clears throat> 20 so, oh I'll, I'll jump in yeah. 2014 was like almost a decade ago at this point and don't remind me <laughs> you look very young or you have a great skincare routine how old were you when you I did the solo ride 22 okay that's yeah, why fresh fresh out of college <laughs> so at that point how many people had through ridden before it's kind of hard to know the exact number especially because you never know who, if they don't really put it on social media or right. on the internet, it's that there's not, it's not really a record. So I would say that there's probably like, you know, maybe like five to 10 that like for sure have done it and maybe the number's more, but like at least that many mm -hmm. have done it before. And there was a gal that had done it in 2013. So just the year before I went out there and I just couldn't find her like contact info to save my life. She eventually like, I managed to track down her brother's number who had helped her the year before, like supporting her. And then she was able to reach out to me. So eventually I connected with her, but I was not able to like track down anyone alive that had done it when I wanted to do it basically. Like there had been one other guy who's kind of like, if you go to the equestrian page on the PCTA website, like a lot of their equestrian facts stuff was like stuff that he's he had uh, written for them from his like couple section rides on the PCT. He did a pretty good chunk. I would, I don't know his exact mileage, but maybe like 2000, is mi 2000 miles. Mm -hmm. I think he skipped some parts in Washington and I think he skipped some of the Sierra, but the rest he pretty much did. But he wrote a big chunk of it and he also died in like 2013. So mm -hmm. like he had been like my go-to when I saw the webpage to ask and I was like, and he passed away Out like months before. So yeah. that was really unfortunate. So I definitely felt a little like out in the dark trying to figure out how to acquire information on it. So that part was probably like the roughest part. Hmm. Yeah, can you walk us through, <clears throat> I mean, that's kind of one of the parts that blows my mind is when I started the PCT in 2017, I bumped into a girl who was trying to do it in Warner Springs or Mount Laguna, but she had two horses and one was her standard horse and one was her high elevation horse. And she had this plan to swap them out 2017? Like, mm -hmm. Oh man, I don't even know who that is. And there was like three other people I knew that started in 2017. There was like Trent, there was Gary, and there was Phyllis. I think Phyllis only had one horse, so she was an older gal. This one was younger, but huh. the what it leads into is, I, I don't know what goes into anything with horses, um, but from the way she made it seem, it was logistically harder than my brain pictured because of the swapping out horses based on where their skill sets were. So how did you approach preparing to start through riding in terms of knowing how to prep your horse for different kinds of terrains that you're going to go through on the PCT and just the logistics of it all? My like ignorance of like anything backcountry kept me from um, doing what, what most people would call preparing. <laughs> I was lucky that I had like super athletic horses to start with and I did ride like very aggressively in college. So I was, 
you know, we'd go out for like a 15 mile ride, like in between classes. Oh, wow. um, so my horses were used to like doing pretty big rides. They were definitely like very athletic horses. And I'd had one horse for like nine years before I started. So that was really very like, I think a key to my success was like, I knew the horses inside and out. And the other horse was I'd had for seven years and I'd had him since the day he was born. So it's like, I knew my horses like completely inside and out. Like I knew what their strengths were, um, not necessarily in the back country sense. Like there were definitely some surprises that I learned as we went down the trail. Like I had no idea my pack horse was an amazing jumper. That, you know, surprised me. He jumped his first tree on our way to Big Bear. And like, I was like, my mind was blown. I was like, you can jump? <laughs> this is amazing. So yeah, there were certain things I got to learn on the way, but I was lucky in that just the way I had been riding in college and even growing up like outside LA or in the LA area in Topanga, like we have very, like the trails are up on the way out and they're down on the way back and it's pretty rugged terrain. So my horses were at least physically in pretty good shape. The one hard part was my main riding horse had gotten an injury the like April, like April of 2013. And, um, and so that was kind of like the big curveball I was dealing with in the packing, trying to prepare process was, am I gonna have two horses or am I only gonna have like one horse that I'm taking out on trail? So I bought all the stuff for two and I'm training like one of my horses to pack hoping that like his mother is going to heal from her like ligament injury in time to then yeah get in shape and then get on trail and that was a big part too of having like my mom along she we planned the start of the trip for her spring break because she was a college professor at a community college so we went out to like the border and so i could kind of like ease the horses into it especially for my horse that was coming off of this injury because i had never done like 25 miles a day with her and especially not after her injury and she'd only been back in full work for like a month so it was very like okay we're gonna see how this goes so i definitely for the first um like week 10 days on trail i was kind of testing to see like how her body was gonna hold up and so i would like you know switch them out part way in the day like from the border to Lake Moraine, I rode one horse. The the younger you what, one. You what one horse? I rode one horse. Rode. And um and when I got to Lake Morena, my mom met me and then I got my horse, my mare who had had the injury, and I rode her just from Lake Morena to Boulder Oaks, which is like six miles. So that was kind of like her first day on trail was only six miles, which was good. And then, you know, she felt great. And the next day, I think I rode her like 16 miles. And then I met halfway, you know, by uh, Mount Laguna and I switched out and then I rode another like 10 miles on the other horse. So I kind of in the beginning was almost doing like two horses a day just because there's so many road crossings in the desert area, you can kind of do that. And so that's kind of how I started. And then after like the first week, I started riding like one horse per day and kind of rotating it. And by 10 days in was when like mom had to go back to work. And then it was just like me and two horses kind of like moving our way through the desert and every, she would work Mondays through Thursdays. And so Thursday night or Friday morning, she would come out to trail and kind of like resupply me or meet me. And then I could kind of give either like one of the horses a break and I could go back to that daily rotating kind of thing. But it kind of got, let me like ease into it and the horses. So that was nice for them. Hmm. So two horses at a time. Are you riding one and your weight is on the second one? Cause I've, I've always pictured two horses being, you have a shuttle person swapping them out. And if you have a shuttle person, you can do that. I did that quite a bit on my most recent PCT ride last year where I was had my mom full time because she was retired. And so she was able to like play babysitter and I would take one or two horses with me depending on how far out we were going. So if you only have one horse that you're riding and you're having to pack like all of your stuff on it, including the horse's stuff, you are very limited in like how far you can go, especially if you're bringing food. So especially in the desert, where there's not a lot of grazing you are logistically having to support your horse by feeding it a lot more food. So if you're carrying up to 20 pounds a day for your horse to eat, you know, that adds up super quickly. So you're really only able to go like one night, maybe two between resupplying before you're going to run out of food for your horse. If you don't have a pack horse, if you have a pack horse, you can go, you know, your typical more like four days between resupplying. So it becomes a lot easier unless you're meeting someone. Like I can't, when my mom was working, I couldn't meet her every other day. So I had to have one horse packing and carrying the gear that I'm leading with me. And then I'm riding the other horse. And that way we could go like four days while my mom was at work 
and then she could meet us on the weekend and like resupply us. So the pack horse was pretty important for doing those kind of longer resupplies in the desert when I was having to like work around my mom's like work schedule. So the pack horse is the horse that's riding behind with the stuff. Yes. And a horse that you're riding would not be a pack horse. Right. Yeah. That would just be the riding horse. Horse fact number one. Um, I kind of want to get into like the logistics of the food. When she mentioned the 20 pounds, that was neat. I'm overwhelmed with questions right now because I think <laughs> so we're, both, I. Yeah, we're both in the same boat that we don't know anything That's about this. That's why I'm asking so, you, not her. Yeah, no, no. So thank you for breaking it down for us dummies. And uh, I'm assuming a lot of our listeners are probably in a similar camp. So I'm sure these are very uh, elementary questions compared to what you're used to. No, it's it's totally about, I didn't know what either, like what to start with. Like I called up a packer when I was trying to like figure out because, you know, I, I, I at least growing up in SoCal knew that grass was not plentiful. And I was like, I should probably bring some extra food for my horse. And mm-hmm. so I called up a packer and he was like, just bring six pounds of this high protein food with you and that's fine. And I'm like, you know, I know how much I feed my horses at home and I'm sitting there like on the couch thinking about like six pounds. I guess it's really high protein and high fat. Like maybe somehow they'll make up for it, but like still in your brain, you know, I'm like if you were to hand me a 2000 calorie like granola bar and like I only got to eat a granola bar, I don't care if it's 2000 calories, I'm probably still gonna be hungry. It's yeah, so like, sure. even in my brain when he, the packer was telling me that, it wasn't quite adding up. And sure enough, as soon as I got on trail, like I learned, like, you know, it doesn't take that much for a horse to start dropping weight. As soon as I saw them starting to like lose weight on trail, it's like, I gotta like just go at this with no outside input and just like use my horse's bodies to tell me sure. when I've met their needs. Yeah. So there was definitely a, a curveball of like learning exactly feeding them 20 pounds. It didn't yeah. start out that way. Yeah. I had to learn real quick. Right. <laughs> Every question <clears throat> prompts three more. Right. You go. <laughs> so, so pack horse, what dictates a pack horse? Is that a particular breed of horses? Is that just a horse that's been trained to carry more weight? How, ex- what, what differentiates a pack horse from a riding horse? Um, some horses do better in one role or the other. Some are good at both roles. So it kind of just depends. Is it just their athletic acuity and their temperament? Or is it like, is there specific breeds that are better for that? There can be like, ideally a pack horse um, is kind of going to have I mean, in the end, they're really not carrying that much more weight. Like you usually only put 15% of a, of the pack horse's body weight you let them carry. So if your pack horse weighs a thousand pounds, they're only going to carry a max of 150. I weigh 140. So my riding horse is almost always carrying as much, if not more than my pack horse. Mm -hmm. So the pack horse in a sense, when it comes to like sheer weight, it's not necessarily as much, but I'm sure like in the end, it's kind of like somewhat of an even job distribution because like I get off and I walk, you know, mm. five, 10 miles a day easily. So my riding horse gets a break that like the pack horse doesn't. Mm. That what, kind of blows my mind. I never thought about walking with a horse. All of this, like, this is so, is <laughs> yeah. I'm new. We're going to do our best to make this less than a five hour interview. So. <laughs> I've so many questions. <laughs> but so when you get off to walk, are you doing this primarily to spell your horse or is this because you want to walk and you want to it's explore both. the trail on foot? It's Yeah, you definitely, when you're riding, like your, your ass cheeks get sore, like your little seat bones, like they start to ache. Um, your knees start to hurt. Like you definitely just start to get, you know, sore and uncomfortable. So it's nice to walk to like stretch out. If it's really, really cold, it's nice to walk to try to stay warm. Mm. Um, and then for horses, like the way that they're built, they carry like 60% of their body weight, like on like their front legs and 40% on their back legs, just from their neck and their head and stuff. Horse fact number so. two. <laughs> <laughs> I warned her about horse facts. <laughs> <laughs> so when they're going downhill, um, <clears throat> it can put like a lot of impact on their knees to like, you know, carry a rider plus the extra weight, plus they already carry more weight in their front legs. So it's, you know, easier for horses to go like uphill than downhill in terms of like their joints. So you like kind of help your horse out more by walking the downhills than if you were to walk the uphills Mm. in terms of like wear and tear. Tiring wise, like, yeah, they'll get a sweat going if it's a really hard climb uphill. Like that part, I'm sure they would love to like not have you on their back. Another but, dumb question. But their bodies a, hold up well. Going a uphill. literal sweat? Do horses sweat? They do. They're like Horse one of the few thing. mammals that like sweat over their whole body like yeah. us. Yeah. Fine. It's like what makes them like such great athletes because yeah. they like can. They're able to cool down. Yeah, they can cool down really effectively. And then they have like 
crazy good um, circulatory system, so they can oxygenate their blood like very well. I think that's why mm. they like handle the high altitude thing so well, hmm. because they just are able to like really oxygenate themselves mm. like more efficiently than like your typical person. Yeah, so I would imagine that means that they're at higher risk for dehydration then, right? Yeah, they are at a high risk of dehydration. Like a, a horse that's working hard, they're gonna drink, you know, 20, 25 gallons a day. Holy shit. So. And <laughs> How do you do that on the dry stretches <clears throat> in the desert? So yeah, you can't carry enough water because you know, like a gallon of water weighs eight pounds. So if you're bringing 20, pound, 20 gallons of water, that's like 160 pounds. So like the pack horse could like basically only carry water for himself yeah. for 24 hours. So like the math doesn't work out for like carrying water for dry stretches. So at least again, like the nice thing about the desert is all the dirt road access. So you have to like ahead of time, like on your zero day, um, like drop water caches at like where the trail crosses like dirt roads and the dry stretches. So that way then, and I'll use like these like five gallon collapsible jugs. So I drop them off on my zero day, but then when I'm riding through, after they've drinking them, they like pancake down mm. to, you know, not very big. And then I can just pack them on the pack horse and continue on. So I don't have to go all the way back and get my water cash. It's like I pick it up as I go along. Yeah. Do you keep this fairly far off the trail at, to not risk other hikers being like, oh, sweet, there's a water cache for us? <laughs> I do. I do. <clears throat> you don't have to go all that far off trail yeah, to like right. hide it from hikers. Yeah. Like they stay pretty much on their 20 corridor. Feet's yeah, 20 feet. yeah. <laughs> yeah, you don't have to go too far. And I'll usually put a label on it too, saying like it's, you know, through rider horse water basically just you know a little extra thing yeah but yeah there's definitely been times where like especially in the big desert area you're a little extra concerned and they drink so much i try to not hit up the hiker water caches because like the horses will just decimate it yeah so you can't really rely on hitting up the already hiker caches because you don't want to like screw over a hiker by like your two horses sucking up 25 gallons as they're just passing through it's so. a good way to make friends <laughs> exactly yeah <laughs> um okay when you get off a horse and you walk with the horse, do you have to hold the leash? Um, I mean, you can hold the leash. It kind of depends on the horse. Like, some of my horses will follow quite, like, closely. And so some horses I don't have to hold. Some of my horses are, especially some of the newer ones I have, like, they are a little bit more, um, don't come from, like, the best situations in the past. And so they're just a little bit, like, less interested in, like, human connection, including, like, with me. And they're kind of a little bit more, like... I might just go off and do my own thing. And some other horses, just their personality types, like some horses are very just like locked in on like their person and they're just like, yep, following you. Yep, we're good. Hmm. So sometimes I hold, sometimes I don't. For the most part, as long as I'm close by, they're kind of just like hooked on. If I like get really far away from them, then their brain kind of like switches gear and they're like, huh, I'm like on my own. I guess I could just go do what I want. <laughs> in that setting, do they know their names? Like, can you be like, hey, horse, come here, and they perk up and listen? Or is it just now you chasing this horse? Um, once they kind of get, especially some horses, once they get into like that flight mode, like I have one mare, and if like you get behind her, and she now thinks you're chasing her. And so like if she like turns around from me, if I'm like leading her, and if I weren't wasn't holding her, if she were to turn around and be facing the other way, and like she see me coming up behind her she'd be like oh my god i gotta go so <laughs> some horses have like a really strong like flight response and then other horses do not like my arabian is very like never runs like she'll for sure follow she won't go off on her own my gelding is very similar like once in a while my gelding will get like i've had i let him loose all the time when i'm walking and there's definitely been times where it's backfired. Like I was um, in the sisters last summer and my hat blew off in like a thunderstorm um, when I was walking in front of him and just like smacked him in the face. And so he was like, what was that? And so he turned around and like, you know, took off the other direction, like in a thunderstorm. And so now I'm behind him and he would only get like 200 feet away from me, <laughs> but he wouldn't start following me. So he's like sitting there waiting for me and he sees me coming and he's like, excellent. And he's like now going Sobo. And I'm like, no, we're trying to go northbound. Come back here. And at one point he passed a hiker that we had passed a little bit ago. And the hiker just like, you know, sees this lone horse coming up the trail at him and just steps off the way and just like, okay, bye, see you. And like, I'm like, catch up to the hiker. I'm like, did you see a horse? He's like, yeah, he went that way. I'm like, you didn't grab him? I'm like, fudge. Yeah, I'm not grabbing that horse. I'm sorry. And, and of course we're going uphill. So I cannot like outrun a horse uphill. As yeah. soon as we got to the downhill, then I was able to like jog to like catch up to him. And he was, he's not the flight type. So he let me catch him immediately. But yeah, it was just one of those things where sometimes trying to explain to the horse, like 
please like no turn around come back like they they do have like very strong instincts so as soon as they're kind of triggered into this like flight mode then you have a little bit of a problem on your hands so holding on to the horse is always the best case scenario so it's a smart choice <laughs> Are all horses spooked by thunderstorms sort of similar to dogs? I know not all dogs, but I would say the vast majority of dogs, certainly. Horses do really well in thunderstorms, surprisingly. Yeah, they never seem to be like that, you know. Sometimes, like, the uh, the thunder will make them a little bit more, like, you know, alert and stuff. But they handle – they don't really freak out. They Hmm. do pretty darn well. Yeah. And you would mentioned that you had at least one of your horses since birth. Yeah. How much of a horse's personality is nature versus nurture? I think it's pretty, like, innate in them. I think they are who they are when they're born. Interesting. Yeah, he was definitely, like, a little bit of an asshole when he was younger. (laughs) And he's definitely got this, like, kind of, like, cheeky, you know, side to him still now where he's very much, like, I don't need you. Yeah. Until, like, you're in the mountains. And then he, like, kind of knows it's, like... A serious matter and then he's very attentive but the minute he thinks he doesn't need you he's like very tunes you out kind of thing and yeah he's been that way since he was a tiny baby <laughs> sassy horse yeah yeah very and he's very smart and confident so he just is like he just feels he knows better but he's at least with age gotten to the point where he realizes he doesn't always know better and there are times where i might have valuable input but unless he thinks that i have valuable input then he tunes me out <laughs> i like that i can already tell that you probably play out a lot of conversations with horses like in your mind when with them yeah this is fun (laughs) um back to the horse food because i've got a few more questions on that before we segue is assuming 20 pounds per horse per day like the general assumption that i should stick with in my brain for yeah riding yeah if you if you don't have grass can you dehydrate horse food question number one it's kind of almost already dehydrated like if you're getting like the concentrated feed that you would buy like in a 50 pound bag at a feed store like it's pretty it's in these like little pellets kind of looks like a rabbit food that's kind of like as dehydrated as it gets Mm -hmm. so it's kind of already there Hmm. how much does it cost to feed a horse per day assuming the 20 pounds i don't even know if i've ever like tried to like look that up (laughs) because i'm scared about it (laughs) <laughs> um, it's not cheap, especially too when you're on at least on trail and you're feeding like more high quality food. It's definitely it's pretty expensive. I honestly don't have an exact number because I try not to think about it. Ballpark. I mean, I'm sure doing like my rides, I, I'm I'm sure it costs at least like thirty thousand to fifty thousand dollars, depending on how many truck breakdowns I have to pull off a through ride. Oh, for the whole trail. For the whole trail. Okay. So divide that as you will. Fifty thousand? Yeah, can. Like I've had a few like big vehicle breakdowns, and like that's Sheesh. that's how you run up money. If, if you have a vet bill, like it's yeah. very. I've had a thousand dollar splinter removed from my horse's leg. <laughs> is there yeah. horse insurance? There is horse insurance. It's usually depends on like, kind of like what it is. Um, sometimes people only get like one type of horse insurance, which is like for colic surgery, which horses have like very delicate digestive systems. Yeah. And so they can easily like twist an intestine or they can get like a blockage in their intestine. And like that surgery is usually a minimum of five figures. Hmm. So people will get surgery for that. Yeah. Very, very typical. So once you get past the desert, are you able to get by with carrying little to no food for them? Like they're just able no. to munch grass? No. I mean, that was like what I was hoping when yeah. I was doing my very first ride. That was my thought process was once I get to Kennedy Meadows, it's going to be lush yeah. green fields. It's got meadows built in the yeah, name. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. It's like it's going to be great once we get to Kennedy Meadows. And especially on the PCT, like the CDT has much better grazing, but the PCT hmm. is pretty much dog shit when it hmm. comes to grazing. Um, but like even in the Sierras, at least when you're going through on a through ride, the Sierras have very strict grazing regulations from them just kind of getting decimated by stock mm. use like back in the 70s. Like they used to do, I've learned, um, like 100 person pack trains. Like, so you'd have like one to 200 people just like riding through the Sierras at once. And just like that much impact just was no bueno. And so they had to like kind of do like a, you know, whole about face of trying to like keep stock from just getting completely kicked out of the Sierra by like then being very proactive and conservative, like very leave no trace, like don't want to get kicked out of the Sierra for our predecessors having like screwed up everything. So then now they're very strict in the Sierra about like stock use and grazing. And they base it off of like elevation and snow melt. So depending on like what the snowpack is, they'll clear like the lower elevation meadows, like anything below 8,000 feet, they'll clear first for grazing. And it'll be like, you know, maybe July 1st or July 15th. And then like it'll go up and up and up, you know, maybe like 
one, a thousand feet per month or something. Mm. So sometimes, depending on the snow year, you don't have like some of the high elevation meadows, like 10,000 feet, which is a lot of the ones on the PCT. Right. You don't go down below 9,000 feet all that often. Um, in the Sierra, they won't clear those until like well after you need to be through. Hmm. So kind of when you're in the Sierras riding is like the sweet spot between when like the snow is melted off the passes so you can get through, but it's not late enough that the Sierras have like opened up the meadows for grazing. Yeah. If you were to like, you know, do a lash kind of through ride and maybe do the Sierras at the very end of the year, like in September, then you'd have like a lot more grazing opportunities. Mm. But if you're trying to like do it kind of early in the season, then you really don't have grazing opportunities because they just haven't opened up the meadows yet. So you have to like still carry all the food with you. Yeah. That's gotta be such blue balls for your horses to be walking by grass that they can't eat. Like I imagine yeah. walking my dog around like a field of steak or something. And, like, like and at least they, they can, <laughs> they can grab snacks. It's just the idea of like not damaging the meadows when yeah. they're wet. And that's the main idea is they just don't want stock in the meadows when they're still wet because the weight of like their hooves, like, you know, it'll damage the root system. Mm. So that's a thought process. So your horse can still like, as you're going down the trail, like they can Sneak grab bites and things. Yeah. yeah, you just have to be cognizant of like whether they're doing damage to the trail. You don't want them to be like walking on the edge of the trail and causing your erosion. So you just have to be kind of cognizant about like your snack opportunities. But yeah, you would definitely would get written a ticket if you were just at the elevation cutoff, if you had your stock loose, grazing in a meadow, even if it was dry, if it is above that elevation cutoff, you would like get a ticket. And the hard part is, is no one in the front country knows it. So you're kind of going in blind and like, mm. until you get in the back country and you hit up like one of the back country ranger stations, I think like one of the first ones you go by is like Rock Creek in the Sierra. Um, another one would be like just over Glen Pass. Like those two ranger stations are like the first real knowledgeable human beings that you run into when you're on with, with horses that can help you get some information. Mm. So you kind of go into the Sierra almost a little blind. And then you hope you run into a backcountry ranger that can like maybe give you a little bit of like direction. So it can get a little tricky. Yeah, how did you handle that? Cause, so there, you do have access to some of the lower meadows, but obviously the Sierra is a very long stretch between like real road access. So are you going in maxing out the amount of food that they're able to carry and just hoping that the low level meadows are enough to get by or what what is your strategy there usually at least two with like the through riding you have to pick like a, already a drought year just if you're trying to like not do the sierras at the end like normally i'll do southern california and then go up and do northern california in june because still you even in a drought year getting through the sierras in june with a horse is like not i did not probable not probable mm -hmm. maybe 2015 which was like a crazy crazy low snow year you could have done it in june mm -hmm. for the most part when the hikers are doing it is not when you can do it you got to wait till like july so you'll come like after doing northern california then i'll go back down to like kennedy meadows and i'll do like kennedy meadows and northbound if the meadows were fully closed i would probably resupply out kearsarge um, I'd have to like meet my mom with a rig at that pass and then just like pick up a resupply and go back in. Usually when I've gone in, at least like some of the meadows are open to grazing. So I'm able to go from like Kearsarge to, well, not Kearsarge, uh, Kennedy Meadows to like VVR. VVR is a really popular, for me at least, horse resupply spot because they have a pack station there that I could buy a bale of hay off of. There's corrals that are like a half mile from like the resort. So like I can post up there with my horses and like, waltz down and get a shower at VVR. It's the mm. sweet spot. So that's like kind of like our biggest pull for resupply. Another big one is um, further north in Washington from like Stevens Pass to Stahican. That's <coughs> a like big stretch. And now that stretch is pretty much like not doable for horses, at least like the last little bit in the middle that they have um, haven't like done a lot of maintenance on. Mm. The, I don't know why it's escaping my brain, like what the wilderness it is, but it's like- Is that near the Peak? Yes, thank okay. you. Yeah, yeah, Glacier Peak Wilderness. Yeah. yeah, that's kind of become like, at least the north end of it has become like impassable to horses. I skipped that this last year when I was riding the PCT because it's like Just I bear- Just too much overgrowth or- The trees, oh, like the downs. same trees on my like 2014 ride and my 2016 ride, like the same trees were still down and they still hadn't cleared it. And like, it used to only be like a maybe a 20 mile stretch that was really, really bad. But then in 2020, they had a fire near the Suwak River. And so you used to be able to like have a trailhead access there that trail crews could come in and at least clear out that whole river area. And they haven't done that now since 
for several years and just like I heard that that area was just an absolute just like bomb went off mm. basically so I just was like no I don't like I've, or, I've already had the privilege of kind of going through it twice and I knew it was bad and it just felt irresponsible knowing that like it was very questionable to making it through in the past and it's only going to be worse and it's even going to be a longer worse stretch than I've ever done I was just like it's just like the cost you know benefit analysis didn't come out for it being a good decision to like go through it this year with the horse so I did a little bit of like a skipped a chunk and I also then did like an alternate to come in just on the uh like north end of the Suwak River mm. so tell me about the camping or Suwato. I don't know I'm saying Suwak Suwato River I get my rivers confused all the time <laughs> yeah same tell me about the camping experience like are you going to popular through hiker campsites and hanging out with them and there's just a couple horses tied off to a tree again dumb questions that's all i've got but what does that setup look like sometimes in the desert it'll come out that way just because like you pretty much are always trying to camp at a water source with horses so sometimes i'll drop my own water cache in which case then obviously there's like no other hikers because i'm just like on the side of a dirt road somewhere sometimes i'll be like off trail a little bit um but there's times where like it's a, you know, there's a water source and especially in the desert, like the hikers very much gravitate to the water sources. Once you get out of the desert, the hikers kind of steer clear almost usually of camping right on a water source, especially in buggy areas because mm -hmm. that's where the bugs are. So it's really only kind of like a campsite competition in the beginning. And it'll only be usually a few times because I'll try almost to drop water caches just to kind of like know in my head like that I'll have a guaranteed spot because it's very anxiety inducing especially with what the PCT has turned into in recent years of like trying to come into a campsite like Golden Oak Springs was like packed with hikers last year and I'm like trying to jam to get in there by like five so I can like get a spot that's like out of people's way but like has enough space for the horses and like tucks us in in the little corner above the spring um but yeah like stuff like that like I'm like anxiety thinking about it all day long about like I hope that we find space I hope I try like to at least it's nice having done the trail before like I kind of know the little off trail pockets that I like will just consistently go to over and over and over again and even at Golden Oak Springs the height the sites right right by the trail by the springs go first and it's like my my site that I want is like not an ideal hiker site that's usually what you're trying to do too you're just like trying to think like a hiker and then not do what they want <laughs> do you have a separate permit system than the hikers no it's the same permit okay. and then there's just like a little like when you're filling out the form for the long distance pct permit there's just a thing at like a check box for as horse yeah like do you have stock like how many and then that's like the only difference um here uh do you do your horses have to change their shoes after a certain amount of miles is it like hikers where like because the horses have the shoes right and yeah you the take metal a, shoes you take them off and put them on you can't take them off and put them on like easily that like, they're nailed on <laughs> i don't know so, anything about horses and like and everyone kind of does it a little differently like some people do almost use like shoes like boots like the take on take off you know shoes mm -hmm. for their horses they're made out of like a composite or a plastic material and those just don't tend to hold up very well so in my experience, I have not liked using them because they just like, they're more expensive than metal shoes and they just do not hold up to the abuse that like you put your horse shoes through on a trip like that. So I like to do the metal shoes and I have to do pretty heavy duty metal shoes. It's not like your standard metal shoe that like every horse that has a horseshoe on has. It's like, has like added borium, which is like a harder metal welded on to you know like the toe and the heel part just to like extend the wear life of the shoe and i'll use like nails that because like especially too on the on the horseshoe they have nails that like basically attach from the bottom of the shoe up into the horse foot and it's kind of like your fingernails so it's like you know the end of your fingernail has no feeling it's the same with like the horse hoof so the nails are going through that part that like doesn't have like uh any active blood and isn't sensitive so the nails go up and they basically hook on and the nails are kind of tapered near the head. And so what happens as the nail heads are starting to wear down from all the miles of like the shoe getting like worn down is it'll eventually get to the point where the nail heads, like the tapering part, they get too narrow and the, basically the shoe just like plops off the bottom of the horse. Mm. And so having an extra nail head basically to wear off is a benefit. So I'll get like nails that have carbide tips. So they basically have an extra chunk of metal stuck onto the nail head. So I kind of have like 
metal horseshoes and metal nails with like extra metal <laughs> welded on to try to extend the wear life. But all basically a typical for how much like hoof they grow out because their hoof like our nail grows out kind of like continuously. And so their hooves will kind of start to get distorted if you don't keep them trimmed on a regular cycle. So like six weeks is a very typical cycle. So you kind of want to hit that six week mark for how often you're changing your shoes. So if I do all the bells and whistles, all this extra metal, I can get six weeks out of my, my horseshoes. And that's kind of what I shoot for. If I don't do that, I'll get like three weeks or four weeks out of my horseshoes before they start just like falling off. <laughs> Are they getting new metal or are you just yeah, taking metal. it off and filing and Yeah, it'll be have to they'll have to get all new metal. Okay. Yeah. Is this something you can do like in the field on trail or do you have to take them to a place? If you are trained and like competent and skilled in it, it's definitely a whole skill set. Then you can do it, but it's, it's like some people's whole profession. Mm -hmm. So it's like you have to be very skilled at it to want to do it on trail yourself. So like I definitely outsource that work. Yeah. And I'll find people off trail you know i'll use google to kind of like find people or i'll call up like a local vet or a local feed store and i'll ask them who's like your local farriers that you recommend in the area and you know i'll kind of be able to know six weeks out like where i'll be at so i'll kind of sometimes before i even get on trail like i'll have an idea maybe of a possible farrier that i want just from like google or if i've cross paths with them and then past rides like i'll have their number in my system and i'll be like maybe they'll be in that area and i can like track them down then there's always like you know the offhand chance that like you have like a shoe that gets pulled off unexpectedly early on and then you're definitely kind of having to just like scramble and find someone on like your next zero day kind of thing mm. I know horses are really expensive. This is like the one thing about horses I do know. So let me know, <laughs> let me know blanket statement if I get too invasive with the financial questions. I'm just trying to wrap my head around how much it costs to through hike with a horse. So we've got the food part. Now with the changing shoes every six weeks, how much does it cost to get their nails done? The, the price has been going up like consistently lately. Like I would say when I was on trail in 2014, it was like $100 to do a new horse. So each horse was like 100 bucks. It's probably now like, oh man, I think I'm usually paying like 180 now. Close. I think I just I just got my horses done the other day when I was over laying over in Aurora, and I that was 200 dollars a horse. Even horse inflation. Yeah. Do, do, oh man, horse inflation's been real bad since COVID. Do you tip the horse manicurist? No, thank God. <laughs> how long How long does it take to usually do the PCT on a horse? Because I can't think about it in six weeks where we're doing six months. Yeah. It's got to be like. It's it's very similar to, to hikers. Really? Yeah, because you'll you'll it'll take like five months is very standard okay. time frame. Especially to like in the beginning, you'll start off faster and you'll pass a lot of hikers. But the horses really do kind of need consistent days off. So like I will always give my horses two to three days off a week, mm. which is like not what a lot of hikers do once they kind of get further on in their hike. Like the second half of most hikers hike. They're kind of jamming and there's not like big extended zero days. So we start off real strong with the horses and we, we're coming out the gate doing consistently 25 mile days, 30 mile days where a lot of hikers have to get their hiker legs. So the first 500 miles, we kind of like look like we're all fast and speedy. And then by the end, especially, you know, in like states like Washington, where there's a lot of obstacles, like the hikers just fly through Washington. And I'm just like, it takes me easily a full month to get through Washington. So sounds like you're taking two to three days off as well you're not rotating horses like going one horse at a time and then your mom's coming to take that horse to relieve it yeah but the only time i've gotten to like kind of rotate horses around was this most recent through ride that i did last year um because my mom was supporting me on the whole for that whole ride so i did rotate horses so i was able to like take less uh zero days for myself but still have the horses have zero days basically mm -hmm. um and I had quite a few horses, but I had to go home several times, like in my last one. So it was, you know, I'd kind of go out for like four to six weeks, I guess four to seven weeks with a trailer with three horses in it and my mom. Mm. And I'd basically kind of like rotate that those three horses as we're going out there for our chunk of time or whatever. Then we'd go home and I would like switch out for someone else at my house um, and kind of give someone a day off or a chunk off a section. So when we'd go home, you know, someone would basically get like a month off trail just because mm -hmm. I had enough horses. In the past, that was not what I was doing because I only had two horses. And I almost never rotated the horses out aside from that first like spring break when my mom would basically come out and help me get started. Except for on my CDT ride, 
she took the summer off from teaching. And so she came out for um, like all of Colorado and Wyoming. And I was able to like rotate horses, except for like most of Wyoming, because that's big sections in between resupplying. Mm -hmm. So from like the winds until into Montana, I needed like both horses and I was only seeing my mom once a week kind of thing. So yeah, there's been times where I've rotated horses, but historically I've mostly had to go out with like two horses at the same time and we go for four to six days and then we take two to three days off. Uh -huh. That's kind of our, our typical pattern. Only if you have a support person can you do the rotation thing. Yeah. So for the trails where you didn't have your mom or another support person, how did you handle the resupply town experience? Are you going from the trail to town on your horses or I don't even know how you manage that. It's a, it's a complicated answer. <laughs> um, and it, and it changes. This is always like the hard part too, is it's like, you know, over a decade, you know, it's been like a definitely an evolution of the process. So like on my very first through ride, um, after like the first, you know, 10 days of my mom helping me on trail, then I was seeing her on the weekends because she worked in LA for the rest of like Southern California. And then once I got to Kennedy Meadows, it's like, okay, she can't just drive out on her weekend to come see me. So then it's like, I have to be on my own. So I had one truck and trailer and I would have to leave the horses, you know, like let's say at, um, what's a good example that I did? Um, like when I rode into Belden, there's a, it's a nice town, um, not a feed store or anything there. So you still have to use your trailer to resupply, but there's a corral. So I left my horses in the corral by Belden. And then my mom, mom's friend, uh, husband's wife, my mom's, my mom's friend, his wife, volunteered basically to drive from Reading all the way down to Belden. <laughs> um, or I guess, no, no, okay. This is not gonna be helpful for your podcast listeners. <laughs> so it's, even I'm confused. Okay, so from Belden, I left the horses in Belden at the corral and I drove the truck and trailer to Old Station, my next resupply point. And a wonderful friend of my family drove from Reading to Old Station, met me there so I could leave the truck and trailer at Old Station. And then she drove me all the way down to Belden. So I would kind of like have that way then when I got on trail, I could ride to Old Station and my rig would be there kind of thing. So I would have to like either link up with someone that would help me basically get back to the horses or I'd have to stick my thumb out and like hitchhike back to the horses. But that's a very big hitchhike to like hitchhike from Old Station to Belden. Do so you, not fun. Do you have instances where you're in town without support? Because I'm just wondering, what, what if you, I can't imagine going through a long distance hike without wanting to go to a restaurant at least once or having to resupply from a Dollar General. It's like, do you just tie the horse in a spot where you'd normally find cars? Or I'm just the town logistics part. I basically, unless the trail like goes right through a town, like in Syed Valley, where like you're riding through town, I've tied like my horse outside, like the little, you know, cafe and I've gone inside to get a, you know, a milkshake and then come back out and like continued on. Um, aside from situations like that, which are super rare, um, basically the only time I'm going to town is on one of our like, you know, two or three day zero sections. And the horses are like posted up somewhere either on or off trail because I always do have the truck and trailer. So when we get to my rig, like for instance, when we got to the rig in old station, I then went, drove them to Reading to my friend's ranch and I kept them in Reading for mm. the weekend. So then I'm staying in Reading for the weekend. Got it. But yeah, basically the, the I'm always have a vehicle, which is kind of like the, the, the tricky part. So moving the vehicle around is like its own logistical nightmare. I think that's probably the biggest logistical nightmare is trying to do the resupplying and having like access to a truck and trailer. So you're not really given the opportunity to have any of these be very social hikes apart from socializing with the horses. Yeah, if, if, if I socialize with anyone, it's the like the people that host me on like my zero days. Like those are kind of the people that I get to know. Um, sometimes they are like, you know, friends of family, like distant friends of family that I've never gotten to meet. Or sometimes they like on my first ride, like I did like a little blog on my website and like some people did find the blog and like sent me an email and are like, when you're coming through Truckee, you know, like, you know, hit me up and you can stay with us. And so like stuff like that, like I've gotten to know those people very, very well. 
Um, and sometimes they've helped me out of some really tight spots, <laughs> especially because I've had vehicle breakdowns and I'm like stranded at someone's house for like a week. <laughs> so are you still that. able to accept the serendipitous help? Because obviously you've got a large social following now. Um, does that get tricky with people that want to help and also being somewhat of a public figure? Um, for the most part, because it's it can be kind of like a whirlwind i think people don't always realize that like you never really have like a day off when you're traveling with horses like i'm always on my days off like having to go to find a laundromat and everything's really far because i'm not usually staying in a town so normally i'm like staying at some either horse campground or someone's place that's not right in town and i'm having to like schlep to town to go like you know find a place to shower or do laundry or go to a feed store and feed stores seem to never ever be close. So I'm easily spending like three hours out of my day just like driving round trip to a feed store and back it seems. So it's a lot of driving on my days off just trying to like gather everything together. So I, I, for the most part, once I got kind of a system dialed in, I try very hard to be as self-sufficient as self-sufficient as possible. And that was the part on my first ride that was the hardest for me because I only had the one truck and trailer, I was kind of having to rely on either this kind of like extended network of people. And me being 22, 22 22 year olds do not have a reliable friend network. Like (laughs) not a single person from my own social network ever came out to like help me on trail. So I was like tapping in deep to like my mom's social network basically and like her college friends and her like family friends basically. And I had at one point, um, I have family in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho and someone had reached out from like my blog when I was up near like the Knife's Edge area on the PCT near White Pass. And he had volunteered to like move my rig from near Mount Adams up to Snoqualmie. And I get like a message on like my inReach device, like pff, I can't remember if it was 24 or 48 hours before I'm supposed to come into Snoqualmie, but he's basically like, sorry, can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, Oops. oh my God. Like that is terrible. Like I, like Snoqualmie has nothing for a horse. Like how am I ever gonna get my rig from, it's easily like a six, seven hour drive. Like how Mm. am I gonna hitch that? And like it's at this remote campground, Keen's Horse Campground, which is like an hour and a half down a dirt road. Mm -hmm. Like not a place you're ever gonna hitch to. And I'm like freaking out. And I literally had to like ask my aunt and her and my cousin to drive from Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Like, in this whirlwind road trip all the way down to like Southern Washington, pick up my rig, drive it. Cause like there's two of them. They need to have two of them because they come together in the same car. Then one of them's driving my rig while the other one's following it up Snoqualmie, drop my rig at Snoqualmie and then drive all the way back to Idaho. And like they like pulled an all nighter basically to like move my rig. That's a big favor. (laughs) It's a huge favor. And so like, and you feel really shitty. Like when you're kind of, you're feeling that helpless and that like dependent on these big favors from people yeah so after that first experience i was like never again Mm. do i want to like have my ride kind of so dependent on other people um that like you either especially that you don't know (laughs) it's just too much and there's too many curveballs too like i'll see sometimes people that are trying to do these long distance rides and they'll try to set up this like network of people and they'll try to get them to like commit to certain days and especially when it's your first long distance ride like your timeline's probably like going to go out the window. And so you've like asked people to meet you in July 6th, but maybe you're not going to show up there until like August 1st. Mm -hmm. And now they have a family trip planned. Like they can't meet you. Like it just is like so much anxiety to try to plan such a big thing around like the schedules of other people and to put them out with such big favors. So after that first ride, I got, um, when you're sitting on a horse, you know, for like a bajillion hours a day, you have a lot of time to think about how you could do things differently. (laughs) And so I realized when I was riding that if I had two trucks and two trailers, I could do like a leapfrog system where if I just had like, you know, a rig at mile zero and a rig at mile 100, for example, and I rode southbound from mile 100 to mile zero, I could load up the horses in the truck and the trailer and then drive north to mile 200. I was just thinking about those logistics in my head and I was like, I've come up with a genius plan. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, exactly. This is the plan I came up with. Um, And so then I would basically have, you know, two rigs and then I could be self-supporting. So, which, you know, it seems odd that like two rigs, one person, but like that's, that was like the money maker once I came up with that plan. And I came up with it decently early, but I just didn't have two trucks. I didn't have two trailers. So I just kind of had to like ride it out for the first ride. Um, that's and, funny because you're 
moving northbound, but you're doing the entire trail southbound. Yeah, southbound <laughs> views. Yeah. yeah. That's funny. Exactly. So, so is I that the that. common way that you see other people doing it? I've never, I know, seen, I've never seen anyone else do okay. it that way. <laughs> yeah, because obviously that seems like a lot of overhead. Like, that's a big expense. Yeah. But logistically, I've, it seems... I don't seems think I've seen anyone else attempt to do... I guess I saw one other person attempt to do a self-supported through ride, mm-hmm. but most people go the supported route where you have a designated person like helping you and moving the stuff around. So yeah, I've never seen anyone else do the two truck and trailer situation. That's definitely just been me. Um, and I've seen a few other people do like the self-supported route or attempt it. I don't think I've really seen anyone else finish with okay. like a self-supported route besides the one I did in 2014, which was obviously like pseudo self-supported because I was definitely had like part-time help from my mom, you know, to help me get through some things. It wasn't like the whole entire trail was me and one rig, you know, hitchhiking our way along. Yeah. So when you do the PCT in 2014, in the through hiking community, obviously there's this whole purism aspect and more so in the AT than these other trails, but I know it still exists to a certain extent on the other trails. Do you feel compelled to do the whole trail and not skip any miles, you know, save maybe fire closures? Um, Or is that just not possible with the logistics of horses? It's definitely similar where you do have this like, you know, that that slight purism goal of like you want to ride all the miles. It's pretty much impossible to ride continuously. So you have to like flip flop around or I don't know if a lash, I don't know entirely if the definition of a lash is like doing it all in one year or if it's doing it in like multiple years. So I don't know if I would call it a lash through ride because you're still doing it in one year, whatever it is Mm -hmm. you're doing, you're trying to ride is all of the open miles that you possibly can in a single year, but probably not in order Mm -hmm. because that's kind of just with the Sierra, that's kind of like the decision you have to make. If you want to ride it continuously, you pretty much have to then find a detour around the Sierra because you're probably, if by the time you were to enter the Sierra in like July when it would be passable for horses, you're then gonna like be very hard pressed to make it to the Canadian border before like the snow Winter. melt comes. Yeah. And also then too, even if you were gonna try to do it, it's almost a little unethical because it'd be such a tight timeline. You'd be pushing the horses so hard to make it that that alone I think would be a little questionable. Like you don't want to push your horses like to that extreme. Mm. So it's also just like from an ethical perspective, better to just like, you know, take it on the chin early on and like, you know, pace it out as slow as you can. You kind Mm -hmm. of don't want to set a speed record. I don't think there's anything to be proud of in trying to ride the Pacific Crest Trail or the Continental Divide Trail as fast as you can, because that probably means like, to like for what expense like that's just at the expense of your horse's well-being like mm. you should be basically trying to ride it as slow as you can <laughs> yeah D- this is no relevance to a lot of things but can horses do whitney <laughs> no okay, <I> <laughs> they can't wondering. go past guitar lake <laughs> um th- and now we'll backtrack to how my mind got there is there etiquette around horse poop on trail do you just leave it where it lands or is it like us where we have to do things for the most part you leave it where it lands like especially like the pack horse like you don't even necessarily know when the pack horse is taking a dump like you might know when your riding horse is taking a dump but it's not even you know unless you're like sitting backwards staring at your pack horse the whole time you're not so going to know when they're even taking a dump um definitely like you try like if you're already off the horse and they take a dump when like you're doing something like in the middle of the trail like yeah it's very courteous to just like kick it off trail definitely try to leave like campsites like i try not to put my horses somewhere where someone would set up a tent like that's pretty common courtesy for me is like if someone's going to set up a tent here i don't want there to be a pile of horse shit here so it's like if they are somewhere where there would be a tent site then i will like move the poop or spread it or get it just like out of the tent area but for the most part just won't put horses where a tent site would be like that's definitely a big thing that horse people should not do is like ruin tent sites for for hikers like you know already kind of disturbed areas so that's for sure something but when it comes to the trail especially too when the horses poop when walking it ends up degrading very quickly Mm. and the piles when it's a big piles when it'll take longer to disperse but at least the idea is even if there's a pile on the middle of a trail there's enough foot traffic that it will kind of get knocked down and it'll be able to like distribute but yeah that's you know the idea is if they especially walk while they poop then it will break down very quickly but they poop a lot you know that's that's for sure they definitely just the way the digestive system works like we take like what one or two shits a day a horse will take 
20 shits a day. Jesus. <laughs> so there's, it'd be very hard to like stay on top of it from that perspective, but just the way it breaks down, like even the, um, I, uh, I can't necessarily remember the exact three letter acronym, but it's like the Environmental Protection Agency, I think. Leave I think no it's trace? the EPA. No, not uh. Leave No Trace, but it's like the literal, I think EPA. Oh, the big like, ones. Yeah, they, they designated horse manure as non-toxic, whereas yeah. like human and dog poop yeah. is considered toxic. So you have to like dispose of it differently. Why is that? Horse poop doesn't even smell. Like, I mean, it smells, okay, but it doesn't on. smell like shit, I would say. You if, don't think horse poop smells like poop? No. I don't. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, I'm biased. <laughs> yeah. Does so horse poop when I went through like this year in September, so this is now making more sense because I've talked to other Northbounders about going through the Sierra, and I was just talking about the sheer volume of horse shit that I saw. And they're like, I didn't really notice that. And I just thought, like, that's weird that you wouldn't pick up on this thing. But now you're mentioning what you're mentioning. Horses probably don't go through during typical northbound season because it's too early for them to be able to graze in the meadow. So I probably went through during a time where there were a lot more horses yeah. and there was just horse shit everywhere throughout the Sierra. Well, I always thought it didn't smell that bad because it isn't fresh. I, You're not, like, I'm walking assuming behind it the doesn't horse. smell bad because they're just eating. If it's like hay. really, really fresh, it'll smell, but it's like it goes away very quickly. Like if you step on even a pile of horse poop, that's like even if it's like fresh out of the Fresh out of the horse. Fresh if out you, the butt. If you step on it, it's not like your shoes are gonna have that lingering smell. The way if you step on like if you, if you step on like two day old dog poop, yeah, like, you know. oh, yeah, like it is at least not that bad. Like maybe you'll get a whiff like like really fresh horse poop. But even if you were to like step on it, even if you were to pick it up, it's not like it's gonna like stick Fling to you around, that same way. <laughs> rub it in your skin. Yeah, it's not. It's not as bad. Wild. Okay, so there's horse fact number eighteen hundred. Yeah. Horse EPA poop does says not smell. Toxic. That too. I mean, I, I won't say what it don't. It doesn't smell, but it doesn't no, smell like shit. Let's yeah, perpetuate that. Okay. If you're gonna if you're gonna grade it, you know, it's like yeah. a three out of ten. So <laughs> yeah. like the dog shit, that's a ten out of ten. Yeah. Like it smells, yeah. but it's definitely not in the same category. We so, should make that like a pH scale or like a, what's the, like the Richter scale? But yeah, it's there we go. Yeah. This, the strong sense of poo. Yeah. This can go in our book. Sure. Horses are zero. Humans Java, are about zero. Java is, is ten. 10. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> Baby's buttery popcorn poo could be a, like number one. I would say that horses are potentially less offensive than even baby shit, but it's a similar thing. You're just eating one thing that is pretty natural, though. I don't know, it's sure. fibrous there. and it's plant material. Like when it dries, you know, it's uh, it's definitely like <clears throat> I can't say I've ever done an experiment, but like human shit when it dries does not like break apart into this little fibrous oh, yeah. fluff. When no. I smash my hands into that. human yeah. shit, it just doesn't feel the same. <laughs> the consistency is very different. Yeah, exactly. So in 14, were you able to maybe not do every mile continuously, but did you connect all of the miles on the PCT? Yeah, all the open miles I was able I was able to do, which was very difficult. And um, in 2016, like I'm trying to remember now, it's so hard all the years they blend together. Like what there were there was very few fire closures in 2014. I think the Jefferson Wilderness was closed for a fire closure, so I think that was the the one big thing that I missed in uh, 2014. But then it was open in 2016, so I got to see it that year. So in your three PCT years, obviously you've covered the full trail in some capacity. Technically, I think the only part of the PCT that remains unridden by me is six miles um, near San Jacinto. Oh, There's is that been... the, fo the frog, endangered frog species? No, that's a uh, Baden Powell. Oh, right, um, right, right. But uh, a little further south, in 2014 and 2016, there was the mountain fire closure. So there's a fire closure that a detour around, and then. For a couple years after there, I think maybe 2017 would have been the one year I could have ridden through it or something. I forget what year I missed that I should have done it. Um, but then there was this big ass boulder that was blocking part of the trail that like hikers had like a rope system to like get around, hmm. but no bueno for the ponies. <laughs> and then they finally blew that rock up and I tried to go ride just that section in 2021. And there were so many bad trees, like literally 40 feet from where the rock had been. There was like this like six foot diameter tree on a cliff face blocking. I was like, you've got to be yeah. kidding me. So PCTA, if you want to go clear out a part of the trail, that'd be really great. That would be, that and the Glacier Peak Wilderness would be like my top two, uh, you know, high priority areas that I would love to see get some trail maintenance. Yeah. Yeah, no, Glacier Peak is tough because you're so far from roads back there. Yeah, so. exactly. That's remote enough. It was yeah. definitely a little frustrating because I was out there two months after the blew up the boulder uh, and then to like have this like massive tree i'm like you've got to be kidding me yeah <laughs> so yeah six miles six miles with the pct i've still not 
gotten to set hoof on. I could tell it doesn't eat away at you. No, at not at all. <laughs> it's not like I'm haunted or anything. Um. Okay, I kind of want to get like a good story, uh, a trail related horse story. The prompt I thought of is, have any hikers tried to yogi rides on your horses? Mm. (laughs) Because I probably would try that. (laughs) Um, I haven't had too many. I've, like, lit a few hikers once I've gotten to, like, meet them. They've, like, you know, in Washington or whatever, asked if they could, like, sit on the horse and get a picture. I've done that. (laughs) I've like Do you charge them? (laughs) No. I've offered to do tail pulls for, like, off of some of my horses that are cool with it. Like, if I pass a hiker on a big climb and, like, I know them, like, do you want to, like, grab the tail and we'll, like, tow you up it? And like some do, some get like just nervous being that close. Yeah, to, I would like, think I this would thing's be, gonna kick me in the teeth. Yeah, I'd be so <laughs> n- I, I would think you were like pulling a prank. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I've and, like I've gotten some to like hold on temporarily, but two of the horses just go uphill at a pretty fast pace. So even even getting like a, a toe, it's like hard to do it like for a big climb, especially mm. if there's like rocks and things that you're trying to like not roll an ankle on. So we've done like short term tail poles basically up some like steep climbs for hikers before, especially if I know them. Animal encounters? Um, definitely. I don't think I've had anything like crazy, crazy. I'm trying to digging through my brain right now. Like I've seen over the years a little bit of everything. Um, I love seeing moose. That's pretty cool. Seeing moose on like the CDT is like probably one of my favorite or animal encounters. And I had a wolf outside my tent Ooh. in uh, the CDT. Oh, yeah, that one was really cool. I was surprised too because like the <laughs> horses are usually pretty like on the ball about animals coming through our camp, and like they'll make such a fuss over like a cow. Like on the CDT, like there's just so many cows in various areas. That's just like the amount of times like my horses would just be like losing their little minds because they could hear or smell something but not see it. Like that really bothers a prey animal. Um, and it would almost always be a cow. And I'm just like, guys, it's cows. Please go to bed. <laughs> but when there's this wolf, like I got up at 2 a.m. just to see if they were thirsty to offer them some water. And um, unzip my tent, and there's just like a wolf hanging Holy out, shit. and like the in the look, camp, in the camp, like easily. Is like, he trying to eat these horses? I, I don't think so. I think he was just like checking it out. But I like looked over at the horses, and they were literally dozing. Like they weren't laying down, but their eyes were shut. They're like they were completely like heads like almost down on the ground, just like completely dozing. I don't know if they thought it was a dog, yeah, <laughs> or what. But they were just like, that's fine. That's not a predator. I assume um, a wolf can take down an adult horse, right? I think so. I mean, I, I mean, I don't know about solo wolf. A wolf pack, I'm sure. Yeah. But like, you don't really see solo wolves taking right. down anything. Yeah. So I think it would have to be a pack. And this wolf was was solo. As far as I could see, I yeah. only saw the one. Yeah. <laughs> Damn. Wild. That's... I would think a sleeping horse would be a great midnight snack. Yeah. I'm also surprised that you were so chill about that because I would freak the fuck out. It was definitely nerve wracking. Yeah. I was like, definitely slightly comforted by the fact that the horses were like okay about it. I feel like if he was giving off like I'm hunting you vibes, yeah. the horses would have picked up on that and been a little bit more agitated. So I got the <sighs> sense that he must have just been, you know, peeking to see what's going on in our <sighs> camp and and he like trotted off once he saw me. He's going to get the rest of his friends, guys. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't fall asleep b- right away after yeah, that. Yeah. I definitely was lying there in my like, t- you know, tent listening like I wonder if he's going to come back. Yeah. So you mentioned Seed Valley ditching off to get a milkshake. Is there a particular snack that the horses are into? Because I know you mentioned obviously uh, colic is a real thing. Like they're they can only eat a small diet, but I know for a fact growing up near yep. horses, you can give them apples, right? Yep. Carrots. Yep. carrots. Carrots. Yeah. What like do they have favorite treats? Ah, uh, definitely carrots are probably like the ultimate favorite treat. I have one horse that'll eat almost like anything, so he's very into whatever's in my snack bag, like. Nature Valley bars, he's into potato chips, he's into... So you can give him that without developing colic? Yeah, I mean, you're, you're not giving them pounds of it. You're okay, like so the like, volume is what matters. Yeah, it's probably more what matters. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so he definitely is like pretty eager to try anything and everything that I'll offer him. So he's he's a funny guy, but uh, definitely carrots. And like, that's kind of fun, especially on some of the spots in like Oregon. There's like gas stations or whatever near the road crossing, and like I'll pop in there and like I'll get like a soda for me, and then I'll see if like there's apples or carrots that I can like pick up for them. And mm. I definitely try to like buy them treats whenever I can. Yeah, someone's commending you on having a very healthy diet. You're like, actually, this is <laughs> like the cokes for me, the carrots are for them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like this bag of carrots is not for me. Um, back to the moose. When a horse sees a moose, are they kind of sizing each other up, or are they just like we're chill, we're both tall creatures? <laughs> They definitely are both looking at each other and are very, like, curious. Like, I'm sure if the moose made any sort of, like, 
moves towards the horse, the horse would be like, we are gone. Like yeah. that thing is bigger than us. I was gonna say they're substantially bigger, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah they're quite big. Um, for the most part, all the moose I've ever seen have just been very chill. And they're just like, they see me and sometimes they move out of the way really fast or they're moving more at a sl- you know, slow amble, but they're always moving away. Huh. So that horses are really good at reading body language. It doesn't take much for them to realize like, oh, that thing like saw me coming and it was moving out of my way. I'm the biggest, baddest thing out here. Yeah. Like they kind of like will pretty quickly pick up that, you know, mentality from an animal. So you're a horse whisperer, but they're just a general wildlife whisperer. Like they can read every situation yeah. correctly. Yeah, they're, they're definitely pretty on it. Like my mule doesn't really like bears much. So she's a little bit more antsy about a bear. Like if a bear is walking away from her, she's okay. But definitely like a bear coming towards her. I'm not cool with that either. Yeah, she's not She's not a big <laughs> fan. I have quite a bit of bear that actually live like near where I live. And so we have bear come through like the property and you know, it'll be 2 a.m. and you'll be passed out. And like all of a sudden you'll just hear this like large like whooshing noise, hmm. which is like horses will blow when they see a predator. Like just like, they'll, like you know, just like rush air out their nostrils. Like not a snort, it's this very aggressive like blowing noise that I can't possibly replicate. But but it's their big, like, I see you, predator. Like, you're not going to get the jump on me. Like, mm. And they're kind of, like, alerting the other herd members. But it's very loud. And so she can definitely wake me up at 2 in the morning if there's, like, a bear on the property. I'm like, okay, thank you, Carly alarm system. Yeah. Got it, bear. What would be a horse's arch nemesis? Cougar, for sure. They do not like cougar. Yeah, hmm. there's nothing about a cougar that a horse is like, oh, it's walking away from me. It's fine. Like, as soon as they even catch a whiff of a cougar, like, they are definitely not happy campers. Has that happened on the PCT? Not on the PCT, but again, just in like outside PCT life, I've ran into um, Cougar in the state park I used to live near in LA and near the like recreation area I live now. I've seen Cougar there and horses are not happy. I've definitely Mm -hmm. had a horse dump me. Like we had a Cougar, like, you know, they always like, they're kind of assholes. They kind of like wait to the last possible moment. And then they're like, I think I'll run away now. (laughs) And that just like scares the bananas out of the horses. Well, the horse is screwing you there if it's dumping you because it's giving you to the cougar. There's no loyalty there. I mean, I think her perception was like, why didn't you just stay on? Like I was getting us out of there. She just like spun so fast that the centripetal force just like, whoop. (laughs) Like I just, I'm off. Can a horse outrun a cougar? Um, Probably depends on the terrain. Like I think... Yeah, like speed wise, they probably could, but like usually that the whole thing a cougar's go betting it on is like not being noticed and they're just gonna like ambush yeah, you. So you're not gonna know that there's a cougar until it's like on your back. I think that's kind of like the cougar idea. So if a horse saw it coming, they could outrun them, but they're probably not gonna see it coming if a, if a cougar's really trying to make a meal. Are you wearing a helmet? No. <laughs> no, you asked that in, in a lecturing way. Like <laughs> well, I'm thinking about I'm thinking about being on said horse, cougar, there horse spooked. Horse starts running. You don't fall off, but now you're in like a horse cougar chase, and the horse <laughs> is running horse faster than the cougar. I would hope to have a helmet on. Yeah, fair. Yeah, definitely for like certain animals, especially when they're younger, like they'll be more prone to like spooking for a non-lethal reason, like. A cougar spook is like very reasonable and understandable. Doesn't happen much. Like, you know, 0.000001% of like the time you spend on a horse will be encountering the cougar. So it's not (laughs) like a high consideration, but definitely when I'm like riding younger horses or like for a long time when I'd be riding my mule who was very like unpredictable, like I was for sure wearing a helmet because the likelihood of like me coming off or them doing something you know, that would make me uncomfortable was like much higher than like a highly trained horse that's like seen a lot. Mm. And a mule is when one's a horse and one's a donkey and yeah. they make a baby, exactly. right? Exactly, yep. Okay. Yep. Half half donkey, I know horse stuff. Horse. <laughs> <laughs> so when you go through grizzly territory on the CDT, are you carrying bear spray? Yeah, you do. Like it's not gonna necessarily do you a whole lot of good, like unless you see the grizzly while you're like walking your horse or it's good for in camp. Like I feel, better like having bear spray in my tent with me for sure but there it's like i'm never gonna spray a bear while on a horse because that's not just probably because it's gonna like get in my horse's face and like there's probably just too many things going on like it's not going to be the kind of an opportunity to spray a bear while i'm horseback is a horse is a bear gonna try to is a grizzly gonna try to take down a horse and who wins that race likely not likely like for the most part most animals don't want to get hurt like if the animal gets hurt taking down a prey animal like 
they, they're then screwed. Like they're probably not gonna then eat again. So like a bear would have to be at such a high level of desperation to think I'm gonna take on this massive animal that could like kick and break my jaw. Like, so there's like a, you know, the, the cost benefit analysis, like that bear huh. has to be so desperate to take on that gamble. That's so, surprising to me yeah. that a cougar is more likely than a grizzly, just cause I feel like a grizzly is way more physically capable than a cougar. I think me just grizzlies anything. have like way more food options because they're omnivores. True. Snacking on yeah. fish and Whereas, berries. Like, and, and cougars don't take on horses. Like it's not a common thing, oh, like in the, but in the wild, like that's like a horse's primary like predator is a cougar mm. and it'll mostly be the old and the young like you know an adult fully grown healthy horse is probably not going got to it. get jumped on by a cougar got it it's gonna be you know a unique situation where the cougar decides like maybe i can do this yeah. but for the most part cougars are going after deer like that's a cougar's main diet is mm -hmm. deer how does your bond with your horses change over the course of a through ride or does it like, do you feel a hundred out of a hundred before the ride starts and then that just maintains over the ride? Or is it, is there something special about taking on a trail with your horses where like it takes that next level? I think you definitely, for both the horse and the rider, like you demonstrate a lot more of like your value. So like my horses definitely really start to value, like you're already kind of the chuck wagon when you're at home, like you bring the food or whatever but they become like very like reliant on you and think that you are basically some sort of God that like you're in the desert and like they're dying of thirst. They're so thirsty and all of a sudden like, you know, you take them down this dirt road and then there's like a spigot, like the horses start to even recognize like spigots and they'll be yeah. like, I see a spigot over there, mom. Like, <laughs> let's go check it out. Um, but yeah, they just start to like really think that like you somehow know where the food is, you know where the water is and they start to like want to stick around because of that and like, hmm. I've had um, one horse that was like very picky about who she like, you know, trusted like horse and human wise. So she was like very loyal. And like, if I like left her in the middle of the trail, like not tied, nothing, and went to go like scope away around an obstacle and I could be gone for 10, 20 minutes. And like, she would just stay there in the trail. And like, as soon as I like came back into view, she was like, you know, head as high as she can get it like ears pricked like trying to like get a bead on me and it's just like as soon as she would see him again like would like you know winning was like so enthusiastic like oh thank god hmm. you came back like that's definitely very like different sometimes than what you feel at home like you know you feel like you're basically just the chuck wagon yeah and otherwise they don't really need you but there becomes this more like where they really seem to like understand that like your judgment in situations some horses and some horses don't quite ever get there like they still don't always realize that like you have their best interest at heart. They'll still kind of get into this like primal reactive headspace where they're just like, ah. Um, but if you get like a good horse, like they'll figure out like, wow, this person like somehow knows how to get around this obstacle. Like I'll follow them. They know where the food is. They know where the water is. And they very much then like look to you very strongly. And that's like a huge amount of trust. And then the same, it goes both ways where like you start to learn like your horses are, very capable and thoughtful in certain ways and like how you know they can have like good ideas in terms of you'll kind of have to almost like ask them when you get to an obstacle like are you more comfortable with jumping it are you going to be able to do this jump are you more comfortable with going around the obstacle like sometimes you'll have to like know their strengths and weaknesses and then trust that they will execute it properly like hmm. for certain horses i have a lot of trust in and for other horses i'm like nope mm -mm, we are not there yet like you have not demonstrated your ability to like not chuck yourself off a cliff yet so i'm not gonna like put you in scenarios where you know there's a margin of error that would be harmful to you or your health because you might make the wrong choice hmm. whereas other horses of mine i know they will make the right choice a hundred percent of the time and like, then I will ask a lot more of them, you know, and it's terrifying when you're like, this could go very wrong if you don't nail this jump perfectly, but like, I know you can, so please do it. <laughs> Have you ever had instances where you trusted a horse to do X, Y, Z obstacle and it went poorly? Yeah, it was a very simple obstacle just in this last PCT ride where we were getting around a downed tree and where the root system was of the down tree was right by kind of another tree. So it kind of made this little narrow like squeeze chute that the horse had to go through. And she was my most reactive horse. Um, this is the same horse that if you get behind her, she's just like, bye. So not surprising. Um, so I took off because when I saw the obstacle, um, 
you know, it was like her, it was her first day on the PCT, poor thing, bless her heart. Um, and so I was like, okay, you know, I'm gonna like minimize the chance of things going wrong. So she had like saddlebags on. So I took off her saddle, I took off her saddlebags so she could hopefully like squeeze through this like root system by the tree without snagging anything. And she definitely could have fit it. Like if I was doing this with one of my like more experienced horses, this would not have been a problem. But, um, and I was even thinking like horses get a little, a little weird sometimes like on uphill versus downhill. So if I'm looking at an obstacle, ideally I want to go on uphill around the obstacle because where you'll have the most problems is going up with a horse. Like if they, sometimes if they will like not know how to kind of counterbalance their weight. So if they're on a really steep slope, they'll start to get just like too much like weight tipping back and they will like flip over backwards. Mm. So what you don't want to happen when you're trying to get around an obstacle is to go on the downhill side, get down below the trail and like around the obstacle and then not be able to make it back to the trail because it's too steep. So ideally when I'm looking at an obstacle, I'm like, hopefully I can go on the uphill side and around it. So that way, if we make it up, I know we can get back to the trail. You know, worst case scenario, the trail's below us, we can get back to the trail. And this, we had to go like maybe four feet off the trail. It was so close, but we had to do it on the downhill side. And so I, you know, took all of her gear off and I'm walking her around this root system. And she's like, we were so close to the trail. Like I'm on the trail and I'm just asking her to like take these last few steps. And she just like absolutely refused. And like in her particular fashion, like she just like reared up on this like downhill slope and just like ripped the rope out of my hand. And like, she didn't fall over backwards, but she just like reared and like spun. So she got the rope away from me. And then she just took off like straight <laughs> down this like ravine. And it was like all of this uh, like kind of like sapling material. Like it wasn't like really full on trees, but it wasn't a shrub. Like if you were standing next to the shrub, they were over your head, but they were very thin and malleable. Like maybe, you know, one to two inch diameter. And so she's just kind of like surfing on top of them, like right down them. And just like goes about 200 feet down, like, you know, not falling. She's like just running on top of this brush stuff into the creek bottom. And then on either side of the creek bottom to come in or out is like covered with these things, but trying to go through them, it's just like the snarl. It's like all entwined. So she was able to surf down on top of it but now that she's like in this creek to go up it, we can't like surf on top of it uphill. So I had to spend um, two and a half hours with a saw, like cutting her <laughs> a path through these shrubs, like back up to the trail. And I had to do it in a switchback fa fashion because of it being steep. Like she could have just, you know, I had to obviously do it to where it connected to the trail at a different spot that didn't have this little squeeze shoot effect. But um, it was so steep and it was long enough a pill that I like physically couldn't do it in one run. And she's the kind of horse that's not gonna like stop and like, be cool waiting. She's gonna get in this like kind of like adrenaline mode. So I had to like design our route out to where we did like a little like switchbacky pattern to where I could give us like break stops where she would have like a safe spot that was like open enough that she could like pause and like I could catch my oxygen. And then we'd like sprint to the next little like, you know, zigzag and we kind of like had to zigzag our way up. But I had to like be very methodical too. Like I probably took me, you know, 45 minutes to even decide where and how I was gonna like cut a trail out for her that would be a doable path. So there's like so many things you have to think about specifically about the horse. Like obviously her being her first time on the PCT and this was like, she hadn't done a lot of backcountry miles. So it was a very much me learning her and like, you know, I, I can tell you, I ask very little of her when it comes to <laughs> obstacles after an experience like this. I'm like, I will never let you go on the downhill side of an obstacle because of like that situation. So sometimes you have to learn lessons the hard way, but like I knew her well enough that when it came to getting out of that situation, I was like, all right, I'm not gonna like do this a quick and dirty way the way I could with one horse. Like I'm gonna do this like to where there's no chance that like you, do something stupid on me. Like I will get you out of here, but it's gonna take me like two, three hours. Um, I just wanna interject quickly. Yes. They have a concert to get to, so we have to pick our juiciest questions remaining. To okay. Let them go freely. We yes. Still have like an okay. hour and a half. But yeah, we probably have had half hours. Okay, well I don't wanna be selfish with your time, but. Is that the bathroom code? It is, yep. yes. Five, yeah. four, three, one. Just skip the two, yeah. Um. Okay, I'll start, I'll, I'll, I'll narrow down. 
Uh, you mentioned a saw. I would never, as a backpacker, just have a saw on hand. So what other what other stuff are you carrying that is specific for a through ride that a backpacker wouldn't just pull out of their pack? I think my saw is also like the only thing in my gear kit that has gotten bigger over the years. <laughs> I think I started like my first through ride with this teeny little, like basically a hatchet. <laughs> like, oh my God, looking back at it, it's comical. But now I have like a saw that um, I'll carry a saw if I'm in like, you know, difficult country. That's like, I think it has like a 20, one inch blade, a 22 inch blade. So it's a big saw, um, it's a folding saw. And so I'll have like that and I'll just like carry it on like out of my backpack or on my back if I'm not having a backpack. So I have a saw, um, I carry these like collapsible water jugs for the horses because I like to get them water for when they're in camp. Um, a lot of water isn't necessarily accessible to the horses. And like, again, you kind of don't want them to like damage like water banks. So for the most part, like I'll just go get them their water unless it's a really easy water access point for them, like maybe somewhere in the Sierra. But for the most part, I'll like haul them water. Sometimes I haul them water a long ways. Like there's some spots like in the in the desert where I've like hauled water like uphill, you know, like a fifth of a mile. And hmm. I'm like making that trip like four times. And it's just, you know, and the end ends up being like a hundred pounds of water or something that you have to haul <laughs> for the two horses. It's, it, it gets to be a lot. So that's the copsable jugs. Um, you have to have some sort of containment system for the horses. So sometimes I have a highline kit, which is basically like you set up a rope between two trees. So you have like tree savers, the rope, and these little swivels that you tie the horses off to on the rope. Um, that's like one form of containment. Sometimes I'll do an electric fence kit. So I'll have like these little posts to stick into the ground. I'll have a fence charger. I'll have electric tape, um, the spool that the electric tape is on. So I'll have to like make a little like pin for them essentially. Um, I'll have like a vet kit for the horses that has- The electrical fence, is that because they're prone to bolting in the middle of the night or what? Yeah, it helps deter them. It's, it's very flimsy. Like uh -huh. it's, there's nothing, that seems uh, <laughs> like this would contain you. Yeah, sure. So you need something that helps convince them to like not push on it. Cause uh -huh. it will, if they put, were to put any sort of physical contact with it, they yeah. would basically knock it over. So it's more of an empty threat. Yeah. 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 And it's, and then, like, I look, won't tell them that you said that. <laughs> I know. <laughs> and most of them too, they do like once they've gotten shocked a couple times, they basically like don't challenge it. And, uh -huh. and like, and they learn, oh, my food and water's in here. Like I don't need to go outside. Except for like my mule, she's very smart. And so every once in a while she'll decide to like test the electric fence and she she knows it doesn't like hold up. She's like, it'll be like one second of like a <laughs> tiny little sh like static electricity shock for a lifetime of freedom. Like I will take that trade. So yeah, sometimes they can be a little smart that way. Mm. Yeah, that'll be the electric fence kit, the vet kit. I'll carry along um, like hoof boots. So I mentioned like earlier that, you know, you can either do like the steel horseshoes or sometimes there's like these plastic boot things that you can put on your horse. I don't like using them full time because they don't hold up very well, but they're kind of like my spare tire. So if I do lose a horseshoe, I will put those on my horse's feet. That'll last us, you know, we can easily do, I like. I wouldn't want to do like a hundred miles in them, but we could, could do a several days until I got out and was able to then get a farrier. So I have a couple of those um, as my spare tire situation. Um, let's see, I think that's most of it. And then basically horse food. Of the trails that you've done, which would you say is the most horse friendly? Probably the CDT. New Mexico's not very horse friendly, like at least in the beginning, like the first, until you get to like Cuba, it's not very horse friendly. Once you get past Cuba, it becomes better, but there's a lot of uh, barbed wire fences hmm. in the first 500 miles of New Mexico that don't have, you know, basically the hikers have to just like shimmy under them or they have this little like ladder thing that you can like climb over that does, is useless for a horse. Yeah. So that part was like the main issue in New Mexico. Yeah, was just how do you manage fences. that? I carried like a fence repair kit with me so that if I had to- You could cut it and then- and, and do it. And I would usually not try to cut all of it. Like it, you know, I'd leave like the bottom strand or two and I would like put my clothes out like on top of the wire so the horses could see it and then they could like jump it. Um, or can the, they clear that barbed wire fence pretty easily? Not the whole thing. So I'd have to like, just, you know, okay. Yeah. Just and, and a lot of the fences were very dilapidated. So uh -huh. that, that helped, or I would walk the fence line, you know, a ways until we found a dilapidated thing that they could just jump. So I wouldn't have to cut anything and then fix it. Or for the most part, a lot of these fences will have like, I call them cowboy gates. I don't know if that's the official term, but ranchers for the most part, when they're herding cattle, they do it on horseback. And so they will have a fence 
that it looks like just a fence line, but it's really like there's a gate, there's like an extra post that you can like unhook mm -hmm. and like detach the fence line. So I'll usually just have to like walk fence lines until I find it. And normally it's at some sort of like junction point or near a dirt road. So I'll kind of look at my maps and kind of just like hedge my bets on like, I was a rancher and owned this property. Where would I put a cowboy gate? Mm -hmm. And I'll just kind of go exploring. But very, very time consuming in New Mexico dealing with that. Hmm. Um, but otherwise, CDT was great, yeah. great grass. So to that point, you've done the PCT three times, CDT once. Is there a reason you picked the PCT? Is it proximity to your mom is a big part of it? I think it was just that first love type of thing, you know, like your high school sweetheart. That's sure. kind of like the PCT. So it had a very like sentimental place. Like I did the first two I did on the, on the PCT was the only three rides I did. Um, and the first one was like such a difficult learning curve that I almost like just didn't have fun. And so I kind of wanted to do it a second time with all the knowledge I had gained and see if I could like improve upon and not have all the same stupid mistakes and hard lessons of the first time. So the second one was like great, great through ride. And then I went off and I did a bunch of other through rides. And then just last year decided like to do the PCT again. And it was definitely, uh, you know, just kind of like how after like a decade or so, if you went back to your high school, like sweetheart, you'd be like, okay, maybe you weren't like that great. Like, and it's not the PCT's <laughs> you not- You haven't changed at all. Yeah, it's not like the PCT's not that great, but definitely now having gone back to the PCT after a decade and after having done so many other trails, it's definitely no longer this like pinnacle, romanticized, rose colored glasses type thing that I did have for it for many years. Like I have now, a lot more appreciation for like other places. Like they're all kind of more on an even keel now. Like, you know, they mm. all have their pluses and their minuses. They all have different things that I love and don't love about them. Hmm. So yeah, kind of like it more uh, brought the PCT down to like earth a little bit going back to it after having done other trails and being it now not such a new experience of through riding. Um, this one is again, pure fascination. Um, We'll use the PCT as an example because you've done it the most times. Let's say someone wants to do this. They are a blossoming horse girl. They want to do this. How or much do guy. they need to, or a horse guy, or Ken, if you've watched <laughs> the Barbie movie. Big horse guys. Him. They like horses. Yeah. Um, let's say someone wants to do this. How much do they need to budget um, with like a bit of a breakdown? I know we mentioned the food. We mentioned the Manny Patties. What would be the overall budget someone would need? Because I know for a regular through hike, you usually say, what, like $2 a mile, six to eight grand. Like there's all these different numbers people float. It's so hard to like put a number on through riding because a lot of it also depends like how, how where you're starting. So like most people that are starting with like who are gonna go on a through ride have owned horses for years because it takes years and years and years to get to the point where like you can like safely handle these animals and like especially unsafe situations. So that alone takes forever. So by the time you're getting to the point usually where you're considering doing a through ride, you already have a truck, you already have a trailer, you already have saddles, you already have the horses. And so then you're only really looking at gear and food on the trail and and like the vehicle maintenance and the horse maintenance. So then that's a very different price point than if you are going into this, like if you are, for instance, like an experienced horse person in another country and you wanna to come to the United States to mm. do the PCT, you're gonna to have to come here, you're gonna to have to buy a truck, you're gonna to have to buy a trailer, maybe two. You're going to have to buy horses, you're gonna to have to buy saddles. Like the cost point then is like, easily gonna be pushing a hundred thousand dollars possibly. So that's like why it's so hard to put a number on it because it depends where you're starting at <laughs> yeah. in terms of uh, how expensive it could be. Um, but yeah, it's not cheap because like a saddle alone, you know, and again, if you buy a new saddle, it can go like two to $5,000 to get a saddle. If you're gonna buy it used on eBay, it's gonna, you can maybe get one for under a grand, but you're probably gonna have to buy several and resell several before you find one that has an appropriate fit for your horse. So there's a lot of trial and error involved. So it's so hard to put a price number on it. But I always just basically tell people, like, I don't think you could do it for less than $25,000. Mm. Okay. How long does a saddle last? If you take care of it, it can last a very, very long time, but you do have to take care of it. Mm. What does and that mean? Like, what? like oil it, um, you know, water definitely damages leather. Depends on kind of what material it's made out of, but water's not great for leather. Definitely the kind of like abuse you put it through on a through ride does not, uh, usually equate to a long lifespan of a saddle. Mm. My saddles definitely get lots of like scrapes and nicks on them from 
bushwhacking and like from trees scraping on it. So my saddles don't always look that great very quickly out of the box. Hmm. Um, but yeah, like I've, I've used, I um, think I got one of my saddles that I took on like last year's through ride. I got it in 2017 and it was still holding in there just fine. Hmm. So. Are you able to resell the saddles that you've used on your through rides? I imagine there's someone that would want that as like a collector's item, knowing oh, that I the wish. story. She's a market it. for everything. <laughs> yeah, right. So far, I haven't found it. But yeah, um, I'm, I was really lucky. I, after my first two through rides, I got a um, saddle sponsor because like getting a right saddle fit was becoming very difficult because I didn't have the budget to go buy a new custom five thousand dollar saddle, and so I was doing the eBay thing of like buying a used saddle, trying to get it to fit my horse, or like having a saddle fitter try to modify it, or just trying to find a saddle, seeing it didn't fit, putting it back on eBay, buying another one, and it was just becoming exhausting. Hmm. And so I did manage to like land a saddle sponsor, because then they would basically just send me out a variety of different saddles until, you know, instead of me having to go through one at a time on eBay, they would just be like, here, try this one. That one didn't work. Okay, try this one. And like hmm. that very much like, expedited the process. Yeah. So that was- You can big. give them a shout out here. I know, <laughs> yeah. Tucker Saddle. <laughs> horses. Yeah. Tucker Saddles. I know. And they now have like great um, saddle bags. I got to help hmm. them like design their saddle bags wow. for like overnight trips. So that's been like really fun to do because there was like this one lady who was making these really nice bags like out of her garage and she stopped, she retired, you know, a couple years ago. And I was like still using those same bags and they were falling apart. And I was like, we gotta do something cause I'm gonna run out of good saddle bags really soon. And even that too was like a trial and error process, trying to figure out like what price point to set them at. Um, they used like really good materials, but like the stitching took a minute to like get right to hold up to the abuse that saddle bags on like backcountry trails will like take so you know it took a little bit to like realize okay we need to redo the stitching here and stuff so a little bit of like trial and error there but i'm now very grateful to like have an endless supply of like great saddlebags too i'm like oh yes good saddles good saddlebags i'm feeling happy but yeah i'm very happy (laughs) did you know that you share a name with somebody who's been on survivor I do. Yes. If yes, if you Google, yes, this little old lady is the first person to show up. <laughs> it is not me. <laughs> um, how long is a horse in its through riding prime? Are you, are you using the same horses on each of these trails or are you different horses for each for trail? For the most part. Yeah. It's, um, horses do have a very long, like good lifespan, like where they can work hard. Um, like my very first horse that I was like taking on these trips, she was like 16 when we got started, which like hmm. some people would classify as being like up there. How long you know? do they live? They, it's hard sometimes to get a horse to like truly live and die of old age <laughs> because they do have this very sensitive like digestive system. Mm. So a lot of horses will not make it to old age because they will die from some other, you know, thing that takes them out. Like they break a leg they get, you know, colic, you know, but if a horse dies of truly old age, it'll be usually um, like close to 30, late oh, okay. 20s, early 30s is definitely attainable if a horse dies of old age. Um, and, but a lot of horse people will retire their horses like in their 20s, is pretty mm. common. So sh- like my mayor Shiloh, she did the CDT when she was 20, which is like very up there for a horse to be doing the CDT. So. My gelding now, he started when he was 10. He's like 16 this year and he still is pretty good. Hmm. Does retiring your horse, is that in reference to Zach's how long are they good on the trail question or is that like? Are you putting them down? Oh my gosh, no. Uh, yeah, I would never put a horse down. <laughs> okay, like, just wondering. Yeah, horses can have a very long like geriatric life. Hmm. You know, like sometimes like when a horse too, like it's like kind of like people, like sometimes, you know, like they'll get arthritis earlier than others. So like if a horse gets arthritis when they're in their teens, like it might not pass for till it's 30. So you might have a 15 year retirement that you're just, you know, giving them a good pasture puff life. (laughs) Yeah. Whereas other horses, like ideally, you know, they're able to like basically work full time until into their twenties. And then probably you have kind of like a dialing back period where like, you're still like able to ride them for, you know, an hour, two hours at a time, but yeah, maybe you're not going to go on a 10 hour ride you know, that's kind of like the slowing down period where you can still enjoy, you know, doing fun things together, but just to not such an intensive extent. And that Mm -hmm. can go on, you know, until they're in like their, you know, mid twenties or even until the day they die. Like some horses, if they don't get arthritis, if they're comfortable, you know, you can basically ride them into their thirties. Just, it's always very individual. Yeah. 
I've lived a good long horse life. <laughs> um, <laughs> what do you do if you see a horse on trail? I've always heard you ste- you step to the upside of the hill if you're on a hill. It's ideally the downside, oh, which is like very counterintuitive. So uh, yeah, I, I think people too, they, they hear at some point like uphill, downhill. They probably even got told by someone the uphill side who just at some point, almost like a game of telephone. No, my brain would have flipped it. That's a, that's a me problem. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, I think it's very common that like almost everyone I run into thinks it's the uphill side. Very rarely do I run into a hiker who's like, oh, it's the downhill side. And I'm like, yes, it is. So it's somewhere it got flipped and then spread through the hiker universe of like uphill side. Um, For the most part, riders don't care. The only time they would care, like when hikers ask me, I'm like, whatever side is like easiest for you. Like that's Mm. almost always my answer. The only time it would matter is if someone like had a horse that was still kind of getting used to hikers and like, you know, a horse is always gonna be new at something at some point in its life. So if if you happen to run into a horseback rider who's like has like some new animals that are still trying to kind of get their trail legs and like get used to, all the busyness of trail life with hikers, that would be like maybe a situation where like if you asked them, the rider would say, oh, can you do the downhill side? Like my horse is probably going to like try to give you a wide berth and the horse kind of might like push itself up on the uphill side. But kind of like what I was saying that one time about like if you're going on the downhill side around an obstacle, it's like that's where it's riskier about the horse not getting back on the trail. It's kind of the same idea with like stepping on the downhill side for hikers is if the horse swings to avoid you because it's scared of hikers, it's gonna swing uphill and then it's gonna be able to naturally get back on the trail. Whereas if you have like a drop off or something that's too steep and the horse swings on the downhill side because it's kind of scared about hikers, it might then not be able to get back on the trail. So Ah. that's the idea is, you know, and especially too, sometimes horses, at least they say naturally, will kind of drift uphill. So especially if you're running into like a pack train, like in the Sierra, if you step on the uphill side, um, and the mule train passes you on like the downhill side, the mules in the back might not know that you're up there. And so you might have some mules on the, on the closer that can see you go downhill and some mules in the back go up. And now you have this like clothesline effect <laughs> and you just are gonna get clotheslined by like a horse that's, you know, in a mule train situation. So that's also the idea is you don't wanna get clotheslined by a horse. So if it's a small group, it really only matters to go on the downhill side if it, if like the rider requests it or it's, you know, because like the horse is still trying to figure out people, but for pack trains, um, it can be smart to go on the downhill side just because you then are gonna avoid like a closed lining situation. Mm. Very good. Is there a standard distance that someone should be off trail or is it as long as you're just out of the way? For the most part, you're just out of the way. That's kind of the, sometimes seems to be the hardest part for hikers is to get enough out of the way because mm. they'll very much underestimate like how much how wide like the pack horses especially and how wide their backpack is and so I'll, I'll very very often I'll have to like ask hikers um to like step like another you know step off the trail because like I just know that their backpack is gonna like catch on like my mm. pack horses boxes and it's like mm, I'm sorry you gotta move <laughs> a little further mm. so it's that's mostly the idea is you just don't want to like be close enough that you're gonna like get taken out by the pack animal and the pack animals boxes My final questions are silly. Go for it. (laughs) Okay. I've got three rapid fire ones and then I'm done. Um, One, can you get a DUI on a horse? Oh my gosh. I don't know. It probably depends on the city. Like, you know, I'm sure there's like some cities that let you totally slide away with that. And then there's other cities that like are stricter. Okay. So maybe it's to be determined. It's close enough to know um, for me. What are your either number one or top three favorite horse girl movies? Oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> number one would probably be secretary. Uh, yeah, secretariat. Okay. Like that one. Sea biscuits. Sea biscuits. What I mean. Sea biscuits. My favorite. There okay. is also a secretariat one, but sea biscuits. My favorite. Secretariat's probably my favorite race horse. Um, another one. They're all sometimes a little cliches. It's hard to sometimes like horse movies when you're an actual horse girl. Whoa. Because they like, get so many things wrong. Yeah. yeah. That yeah. I wouldn't expect. Like, I hate Flicka. I, I hate downloaded hate. I was going to bring up Flicka. <laughs> I, I downloaded oh. Flicka for that flight. <laughs> and I ended up watching Dance Moms instead, but I literally have Flicka downloaded right yeah, now. I've like never I seen it. Like, I can't stand Flicka. So um, you're out on the girl finds love in horse, like, genre? It's, it's more just, like, the, um, the way that, like, sometimes they portray, like, training a horse that is just, like... 
can't stand it. Like I think in Flicka, she like offers the horse an apple, and it's like, oh, voila, best friends for life, no more problems. <laughs> it's just like it doesn't go down that way. How but about yeah, like, biopics are better. Do you watch Yellowstone? No, kind of similar. Like okay. I've watched it enough, but it's hard sometimes to sus- suspend reality. Like I love. Um, certain characters in Yellowstone, but it got to be a little bit too almost like dramatic. Uh-huh. Like even when they're just like running after the cattle, it's like that's not how you go get cattle. Got it. Or I think at one point um, the Duttons like start collecting like reining horses, and like their ranch is supposedly going under, but they have helicopters and like <laughs> fancy SUVs. <laughs> I and, love how much this eats. And like yeah. hundreds of thousands of dollars in vehicles and in right. assets, but they're complaining about the ranch going under. Yeah. It's like sell some shit. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so maybe we should. That's rephrase a great this. Point. I never thought about that, but we that's should, a great point. We should rephrase this as horse movie name in or out. For example, <laughs> Hidalgo, are you in or out? I'm in. I, I do love soft Hidalgo. Spot. Uh, Black Beauty, in or out? In. Makes me cry. Okay. You got any others? No, I've never heard of the last three movies that you just. You've never <laughs> seen Hidalgo? I've never even heard of Flicka. It's got. Okay, well, Flicka, that, I don't. That's. You're okay on that. Yeah. Um, Black Beauty is a classic. Everyone should know about that one. Hidalgo has Aragon from. Lord of the Rings and it's him and this horse that go on this like desert race yeah that's life or death very unrealistic but it's entertaining enough that oh, like so I'm, I'm able to suspend the realism Fair. side okay and then Seabiscuit is sea a Biscuit horse I'm aware of yeah that one I know that cool. one's good yeah okay that satisfied me I'll uh, save my last question for last yeah well so I mean my questions are mostly <laughs> wrap-up questions because uh you're obviously a wealth of knowledge on this having lived it and like you're able to explain everything to an extent that Chance and I can understand so well done <laughs> you make Bravo. a great like kindergarten <laughs> teacher um but I'm curious how you monetize this I see on your website that you've got different opportunities workshops consultations let people know uh where they could go if they wanted to be able to pick your brain more how they could go about doing that yeah, definitely shooting me an email. It's like usually the first place to start. It's hard to keep track of anything on Instagram sometimes. So email, I can always like, I have my little file systems. So email is a great way to get in touch with me. Um, and yeah, and I started doing, I have like some uh, PDF stuff that kind of is like helps people get started and just answers the basic questions because I always felt guilty asking people like for money to answer like basic questions. Mm-hmm. But the problem is too, people don't always realize what they think is a basic question is not a basic answer. Now you can send them this. Yeah. And it was <laughs> to these idiots. Yeah. And it was just, um, it was just so time consuming to answer people's emails for free. It was like, it was too many hours of my day. So I did like the, you know, d- very cheap downloadable PDFs to kind of like cover the basis. And then when people have like kind of are able to kind of more focus and concentrate their questions, if it's really simple, and quick and it's not going to take me like an hour to write an email like for sure i'll just like answer those emails um and then if it's like more help like trip planning especially if it's a really big trip like those are kind of fall into like the consultation categories um i sometimes have done like some mentorships i've had a few people from abroad come and kind of want to know how to like get started and how you do something abroad so i've done a few like mentorships for abroad stuff um and then the workshops are really good for people like in country. Right now I'm kind of like stuck on this on the California Central Coast, but I'm like I'm working on expanding my abilities to get off of the Central Coast for the workshops. But the way I run my workshops, I need like a um, a screen. It's a lot of uh, show and tell kind of stuff that makes it hard to take it on the road. So that's why it's been kind of like stuck on the Central Coast because the way I present material, it's not very mobile. Mm. Mm. What is uh? Go ahead. I added a question from that. What's one of the biggest questions that you oftentimes get that we haven't already asked? Oh, I mean, I mean, you you guys do a great job. For the most part, too, it's people don't even know what questions to ask. So it's more having to kind of like probe. Like a lot of people don't kind of realize just like, again, the lack of food. They don't even really understand that they have to think about resupplying. And so that's usually the question that like I ask people you know, when they shoot an email to me is I'm like, what's your resupply strategy? Cause that's so individualized. It depends on, do you have a person? Do you have multiple horses? Do you have multiple vehicles? Blah, blah, blah. Um, so like that's so individualized that my ability to like help someone or help them kind of figure out like what their ride's gonna look like really hinges upon the resupplying part. So that's almost always like what people need to kind of like start with <laughs> is like, how am I gonna resupply? Hmm. I think we should let them go to their concert. I think so too. Yeah. Uh, 
Gillian, this has been fascinating. Every, we it lived up to our very high expectations. Uh, I'm sure we could probably go on for another two hours. We've got plans. <laughs> okay, we'll do yeah. a follow up. Yeah, we'll yeah. Do a follow I love calling sure. Colorado. Sweet. Any excuse to come back? Cool. Hell yeah. We would love to have you. Well, yeah, this has been amazing. Please let people know uh, about your website, Instagram, and wherever else you want to direct them. No worries. Yeah, my website is gillianlarson.net, and my Instagram is through writer. So that's a little easy. It's like through t h r u underscore writer. Awesome. This has been excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Nay. <laughs> How long were you holding on to that? I just thought of it. <laughs> <laughs> Your improv skills are. <laughs> Question of the day. What window of time is appropriate for eating dinner? I love this. Uh, what dinner time makes you a sociopath barring an odd hour profession? Oh, is this a you original or a me? Um, or the fact that it includes sociopath makes me think that it's me, but I definitely didn't include this. So this might be a Rachel or Mara original. I'm guessing Mara, if anyone. I would say Mara. Uh, yeah, see, this is hard because I get in my head about this with work when I'm calling people that are on the East Coast and it's 530 for me and 730 for them. Yeah. But I also have vivid memories of my dad getting pissed off when the house phone would ring. Um, and my family was a strict 530 family. 5.30. 5.30 p.m. I don't know. Did you go to bed hungry a lot of times? Yeah, I probably snacked a lot. Yeah. Um, but they, I just, I remember thinking it was crazy when I went to call someone and it was like 8 p.m. and they were having dinner. Yeah. So I think that is my range based on childhood memories is starts at 5 because that would be where the prep work for 5.30 would come in and ends, I would say, around 8.30 because I'm adding an extra half hour to knowing that there were people in my youth who had dinner at 8. Speaking of your childhood, I saw a photo of your mom when she was very young, and it was interesting. She looks at, I can see, obviously, you guys look alike, but seeing her young was a eye-opening experience. Let's backtrack a second there. Where did you see this photo? Almost positive Instagram. Oh, you follow my mom? Yeah. Duh. Yeah, cool. Okay, yeah. She, your mom and she I are a tight on Instagram. Yeah, she's been sending me some oldies. Yeah. Um, what were your thoughts about young mom? Just, I was uh, kind of, this happens all the time with everyone's parents, but you guys look so much alike at that age. Like, I, you're, you're probably similar in age now as to when she posted that photo. <sighs> I'm pulling this up. Uh, she's brunette. She's got, like, black hair in this. Yeah, but I'm, not every attribute has to be identical. You guys have similar facial structures. I definitely saw a lot of Juliana when I looked at young Sarah. See, I've gotten more comments from people, like especially my my best friend would text me on the PCT photos that I'd post on Instagram where she'd say I'd look just like my dad. I saw your dad too. You guys this are one. you're a good blend. Yeah. I look like that? Yeah, I see elements of you. I think the smile maybe. I don't know what it is. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Um, where were we going from that? <laughs> <laughs> what were we just talking about? Oh, dinner time. This, yeah, dinner 5 time. 5.30, yeah, five, yeah. 5 to 8.30 is the window. Um, yeah, the dinner time window has definitely shifted for us. Everything right now revolves around baby schedules. So it's either during their last nap, which means we're eating very early. So yeah, we have some dinners at like 5.30 or so. Um, or sometimes we do it after they go down for bed. But lately that's like been going into battle. So we're so emotionally drained that sometimes we'll just like eat a disgusting snack or like a bowl of ice cream and then just pass out yeah i'd say present day chance my dinner window is i'd say six to seven forty-five. because if it's earlier than six i'm going to try to wait a bit so i don't get hungry again yeah if it's and i say seven forty-five because once it hits eight i get into the mindset of why bother yeah where it's like can you just we might as well wait till tomorrow at this point <laughs> I have a really time threading the needle in terms of eating dinner at the correct time. And for whatever reason, this stuck with me as a kid, but uh, I was watching an episode of Oprah and she was talking about like her top tips for losing weight because she was notorious like up and down. And one of her top points was go to bed a little bit hungry every night, just a little bit, not mm -hmm. like hungry, hungry, but a little bit hungry. And um, I've just noticed every time I go to bed and I'm even like 1% hungry, I can't fall asleep. Like I have mm. to have no hunger to be able to pass out. Um, I don't know why I brought up the Oprah thing, but if I eat dinner too early, 1000% chance I'm gonna have a snack. And it's just, I'm the most unhinged when I'm eating at like 9 p.m. It's just like peanut butter, Nutella, potato chips, ice cream. It's the worst shit. 
yeah, I think I'm um, around people who do intermittent fasting, mm. where they like to fast from yep. 8 p.m. to noon the next day, yeah. like something like that. And so I've just always got the mindset in my mind of if you eat food after 8 p.m., you gain weight, uh, which is probably really healthy to have ingrained in my mind. But so anytime after yeah. 8 p.m., I like get hungry and I'm like, do I want to gain weight tonight? <laughs> Are you able to fall asleep hungry? Maybe I'm just weird. I mean, I can't fall asleep like famished. Yeah. But there's the downside too, and I know I've spoken about this before, where if you go to sleep too full, you wake up starving. There's... I've been listening to too much Huberman. I'm not even sure if this is the podcast that I picked it up from, but there's a lot of negative health things that happen if you eat too close to bed as well, especially yeah. if it's a big meal. Like it disrupts your uh, growth hormone release. There's a lot of bad things that happen with it. I don't think it takes you longer to reach like a deep level of sleep. So yeah, I don't know. But just another thing that we all need anxiety about is thinking about the time of when we consume a meal. I'm mm -hmm. sure our ancestors didn't think about that at all. It's just like seafood, eat food, sleep. Well, I don't think they'd be eating after the sun goes down. I think that's where the intermittent fasting comes into play, is that when the sun's down, our cavemen ancestors aren't hunting, Except are they? The people that are in Iceland in January and they get like one hour of daylight per day. Yeah, I guess we can't limit them there. Yeah. Um, Those aren't our ancestors, though, are they? Maybe. Probably our, uh, well, let's see, I'm mostly English, Scottish, but that's far enough north where they have very short, not yeah. like very, very short days. But I guess I could be Icelandic. Yeah. Um, blank. Yeah. Right. Subliminal marketing. Blank thing of the week. Thing of the week. Haven't done anything notably smart <laughs> or stupid. Hey, that's a win. Um, I'll go. Yeah, you and go. Do, you can do yours. I was thinking about maybe making this a full blown segment because uh, it's sadly probably my only backpacking trip of the year, but this is my hike of the week. Yes. I just did uh, 40 ish miles in the Goat Rocks wilderness. Um, originally, we were supposed to do the Devil's Own Loop five days before I got there. Fire breaks out, as tends to happen when I have backpacking Classic. plans. Yeah. Uh, so we were juggling a few different plan B's. One of them was to go to the Olympics, but just dealing with permits and that logistically was kind of difficult too. Uh, I just, I, since hiking the PCT, I just r was romanticizing the knife's edge stretch mm -hmm. in Goat Rocks Wilderness. And I was hyping it up to the guy that I was hiking with. I've done a lot of backpacking trips with him. Um, just, this is the best day on the PCT. And as we were getting there, I was getting worried that I had overhyped it. Like everything is always relative to expectations, right? And I'm like pitching this to be the greatest thing that's ever I happened. I do that too, so let yeah. me know. He was blown away, oh, good. I, as was I. It, it was as good as I remembered. And just because I was so horny for some backcountry experience, like it just was magical. I was uh, strategic with our campsite selection. We camped basically right at the base of Old Snowy. Um, so we had an epic sunset and on a very clear day, um, we hiked north and then back south again. We did out and back on the knife's edge the next day and then circled off the PCT and camped in an area. You can actually see this lake from where we camped. You can see it from the PCT for a while as well. It's called Goat Lake. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, I think it's glacial runoff, whatever. It's the water is like translucent, bright, almost like a greenish turquoise Ooh, tint. Yeah. And it was so hot that when I was out there, we were in Packwood getting our supplies and grabbing a beer. Um, and like, I forgot if it was a bank or what it was in town was displaying the temperature. It was 106 Ew. in Packwood. <laughs> yeah. It, like, it was one of those days where if I was hiking on the PCT, I'd be like, let's just take three zeros because yeah. this is fucking stupid. Um, but we didn't have that flexibility. So it strategically picked campsites that were either very high at Old Snowy or the next day we ended up at the lake and we're just taking dips in that. Uh, and yeah, it was just, it was fucking awesome. I do have a few notes for like gear things or just like. Oh, uh, a one minute gear review? Yeah, sure. Okay. So I, I don't often pump sponsors during the podcast. And actually I doubt they're even a sponsor for this show anyways. Um, but one I was excited to try was Pact. The one with the, their full kit is a uh, the trowel, those mycelium tabs that you don't eat. You don't eat. You put them on your poo, and then <laughs> the wipes. 
I can't speak to the mycelium tabs because like I'm not gonna go revisit where it took a shit. I'm gonna dig it up like a hungry dog. Yeah. Um. But I will say it was nice to have the peace of mind because I when we ate in town, I think whatever I ate didn't agree with me. So those poops were toxic. So knowing that I was doing maybe a little bit of something to offset that was helpful. But these wipes are amazing. They are incredible. So they're it's like a little. You sh- if you haven't grabbed the packs yet, you should. I've got one in one. the car. <laughs> they weigh nothing. So that entire thing has 25 wipes in it. Sure. You pour a little bit of water. It first expands up, kind of like into like a can of Pepsi or whatever. And then it like unfolds from there. And it's a large wipe. It doesn't have any chemicals in it. And wiping your your ass with a fresh wipe and just being able to toss it in your cat hole and knowing that there's not anything bad in it. Like the way that they pitched it this to me is that even toilet paper has chemicals in it. This is just paper and water, and the tabs will actually help break it down as well. You get a very clean butthole very quickly relative to other options. Have you used wet wipes on trails before? Like, Yeah, and I pack those out, but I usually use it as like my last safety wipe. Mm. But even then, I still feel a little bit weird carrying out something that has shit remnants on it. on it. Yeah, so I usually... Sometimes I'll use it as my last wipe. Sometimes I'll do it at the end of the day just as like a safety situation. Um, but to to be able to discard it guilt-free was a, a very cool feeling. A guilt-free wipe is a freeing experience. Yeah. Um, and my friend Chris, he shat first. And literally his review, he has no financial incentive whatsoever. whatsoever. His quote was, this is a game changer. Whoa. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Wow. I got to find some time to get out on a trail then. So if nothing else, I think it's worth it just for the wipes themselves. I don't know if they sell them individually. I bet they do. Um, but the, the whole system is good. I didn't use the trowel just because, you know, I have a lot of experience digging stuff up. i shitter. Yeah. I go right on the middle of the trail at, or in the lake. Um, you know, dig up a rock, take your trekking pole, whatever it takes. But those wipes, man, they're fucking awesome. Yeah, we got to see if they, they've they got to do like re-ups. No one's, you know, using a trowel 25 times and then yeah. going back from new trowel. Right. Um, no, that's a good, I would, because I would definitely pack out the tabs and the water wipes. Yeah, no, they're awesome. And it doesn't take much water at all. Just like a couple of small splashes and you've got like a very juicy wet wipe. And it saves weight to not have yeah. the wet, the wipes already wet. I'll be using those on the rest of my back backpacking trips. Love that. Yeah, for us. Uh, um, okay. What else did you What else did you jot down? Um, I want to test this more, but they they're a forthcoming sponsor. So if if you're gonna buy from them, maybe wait until we can run their ads so you can get a sweet discount. Oh yeah, uh, and but, so we look good. Yeah, uh, catabatic. Mm-hmm. I got to sample, and you got one too. I'm saving it for the. I'm gonna do a. I've been watching a lot of TikTok girlies do the unboxing. I feel like that's a big video that's in. Yeah. So I have it still wrapped up, which is hurting me to not open it. But I want to do a cute little unpackaging video. You should. And the jacket, this is going to be no surprise because we're both very big fans of their quilts. Stands. Yeah. But just imagine the quality of the quilt as a jacket. And uh, it fits perfectly. Like sometimes I have the issue where like the shoulders are too tight, but the rest of it fits or like it's super baggy if I size up this for me. Anyways, this this fit really nicely, v- incredibly warm for the weight and for the quality of the jacket. Um, the price point is amazing because I've used like very top end down jackets before and they're much more expensive than this. So nothing but amazing things. Uh, I use the Tarn and you have the tin cup. Or do I yeah, have no, I've got the tin cup, I okay. believe. Yeah. The I tar- got whichever one you didn't because I was trying to be versatile. Yeah. Uh, huge fan of that. That was awesome. Hell Obviously, yeah. I didn't need it that much because of how hot it was. But, you know, I've used enough down jackets that I'm able to make those assessments. Um before we started the trip, uh, my buddy has the bee free and I told him I was going to bring the squeeze and in past experiences, he hates the squeeze, how slow it is relative to the bee free. And of course we get out on the trail and he hadn't used his bee free in a while. And like, we're filtering water next to each other and his is coming out as like a drip, one drip at a time and mine's flowing, you know, <clears throat> A new squeeze compared to a new bee free. The bee free is much faster. Yeah. But like my squeeze had seen probably a few hundred miles at least at this point, and it was just running laps on his. So ironically, he ended up using my squeeze for the rest of the time. We can so, zoom in on this, Sarah. Yeah, it, they're not 
they've sponsored us in the past and i i rotate my filters all the time but uh it's just fun to be reminded that an, an old squeeze is going to be faster than an old b free because those things clog and once they clog there's no back flushing like there's no way to fix it you just buy a new filter um and my biggest fuck up of the trip and this is something you know now with many thousands of miles under my belt i'm still making fuck ups was I brought, and this is no fault of the tent itself, but I brought the Gossamer Gear, the one, and using a single wall tent in that hot of an environment, especially with no risk of rain, was a fuck up because uh, we were there during the per side. The meteor shower. The meteor shower. And you were looking up at fabric. Exactly. Yeah. So I could only see, I was able to roll the doors back and I could see out, I got maybe like a 90 degree view of the stars, but all night long, my buddy who was in his big Agnes was just watching a meteor star show and I'm in my tent just being like, oh man, <laughs> stop telling me when you see this shit. Uh, also, a single wall tent's just much hotter, so I would have been happier in just like a bug net option, but. I never would have thought about that as like a benefit of, for example, the Fly Creek. Yeah. That and, makes sense. And that's also specifically a nice thing to have when you know the forecast is going to be clear because um, I probably could have gotten away without even bringing the rain fly at all and just living in the bug net portion of the tent. But yeah, those were my big gear takeaways from the hike. Okay. I like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. I like that you very quietly went on this trip because you just like subtly put Zach packing on the calendar <laughs> and no one noticed. Um, I noticed because... I had added my days on there, but there was one day where Mara was just like, is Zach backpacking right now? <laughs> I was like, yeah, yeah, I think, yeah, I don't even know where, but yeah, he is. Yeah, no, it was, it was good. I reset my soul a little bit. Like I badly needed some backcountry time and yeah. it scratched the itch. And then within 48 hours, uh, the, the babies have been the worst that they've been in their entire lives. So straight back to reality. Yeah, they're that children. Yeah. Mm. Triple crown. I don't know where this one came from. Is this a you? I have no idea. Let's just give credit to Mara then because okay. it, it wasn't me. But this is the triple crown of things that float. Yes. You want to go first? Sure. I'm going to go life vests. Okay. Um, Huge yeah. asset when when you need to float and you've got something that floats. Yeah. Imagine being can... on the Titanic without a life vest. Funny enough, that was another one on my list just for <laughs> just for not doing the job well. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe I'll think of something different. That's a good one. That's okay. a very good one. <clears throat> um, the first one that came to me, just the word float triggered me to ice cream. Ooh, ice cream, ice cream float. It's been a very long time. So I don't I can't I don't think I've had one in probably at least five years. So does this encompass like a root beer float? Because those yeah. things rock. Yeah, that that's the best. I might have to go home and have one. Oh, ice cream floats would be so good today. So right? good. Yeah. With no um AC. Yeah. My next one is, um, I'm sure you've probably never experienced this because you're a girl, but weird poops. That float? Mm -hmm. I, th I think this is uh, indicative of you not digesting fat well, or maybe there's too much fat in your diet or whatever it might be, but there is a certain uh, variety of poop that they're like skinnier logs that just hang on the top of the water. Okay, those so, are always funny. Yeah, they are funny, but yeah, they mean something. It means some things awry. I, I get them from time to time. Okay. Um, my next one is just things that you don't expect would float when you're on a body of water. For example, mm. you're on a lake and your sunglasses fall off and you have that moment of my life sucks. And then you look down and they're just floating. Always a chill move. Sure. Do you have a specific example? Sunglasses. Okay. Yeah. Like there's, and the best times that this can happen, the most gifting times this can happen is in an ocean. Cause I've lost sunglasses in an ocean where the second they leave your hand, you know, you're never seeing them again. They should make sunglasses that have some more buoyancy to them. Cause I feel like all of my sunglasses don't float. Or at least they haven't. And now I'm trying to think about if gooders float. We're going to need to do a I know for study. a fact that they didn't float in the Creek I was in. So <clears throat> last day, we didn't budget time to do like a hotel or anything like that. Literally the last day we did an eight mile hike and I, he dropped me off straight at the airport and I, I didn't want to show up at the airport. The, and especially 
this stretch of trail is very dry and sandy. It's like the, the sand permeates through your shoes and socks, your feet turn black and that happens instantly. Like you don't have to be a through hiker to experience this. A day hike will do this to you. Um, so I didn't want to show, show up to the airport like that. So the last Creek that we crossed fortunately was very close to the trailhead. So I just give myself a quick rub down and I have my glasses on my hat and like I bend over to, to get it and my sunglasses fall into the Creek. And at that point I thought they were gone forever. Fortunately, I chased them very quickly. They got snagged on a rock and I got them, but um, yeah, not floaters. I've seen, there's a smart move that I saw someone do at a lake. I didn't do this, but I learned this from them, which is if you cut a piece of a pool noodle and you put it in a Ziploc bag with your phone, then you could bring it on like a paddleboard or something. Mm. Because then if you drop your phone and it's in the protective zip ziploc, so you could still touch it and look at it. But if you drop it off at any time, it's got the pool noodle float to float to the top. Is the noodle inside the bag? Mm-hmm. And it still floats? Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. That's a good tip. Yeah. They put like a, they had a noodle cut in half and they had a half on one side and a half on the other in like a gallon Ziploc with the phone in the middle. Mm. And they're like, yeah, I don't have to worry about my phone now. Hmm. Insanely smart. That's a good one. Um, my third one is going to be floats. There you go. Especially the floats that float really well. Yeah. Because sometimes I like the idea of being in the water, but I don't actually want to be in the water. Sure. And so I'm a little on the fence about floats that somewhat float where like you go to lay on this float and you're kind of also in the water. I'll avoid those a lot of the times. Didn't you have floaties when you did the JMT? I did. Um, the number one reason I brought a specific float instead of using my inflatable sleeping pad is because I wanted the full buoyancy. Sure. Uh, those are cold lakes. Yeah. Fun boys. I'll give a shout out to them. If they ever want to sponsor this fun boys have the best floating floats. <laughs> I've never even heard I don't of even this. put on my swimsuit sometimes when I go in the pool. I just go straight onto it when I'm having a stressful moment and then I float for a bit and I come off it. Yeah. Uh, the world's, what, what was the tagline? The world's best luxury pool floats. There you go. They're branching out into sleds now, inflatable Ooh. sleds. Ooh, so, that's fun. Yeah. <clears throat> um, my last one is fat guys. And I, I can I can tell how lean I am by how much I'm floating. I, I don't want to float. I want to sink to the bottom because that means I'm I'm pretty lean at the moment. Um, Would fat guys not sink? It's the opposite. Fat guy, you the fatter you are, the more you float. Yeah. Oh. That seems counterintuitive. To yeah, me. muscle is denser than fat, huh. so you sink when you're uh, you're leaner. So strong guys. Strong guys sink. You can also float just by inhaling more make your, making yourself uh ha having more air in your stomach and lungs i guess right, lungs. water or yeah. air floats on water yeah but yeah I, c I can tell how good or bad i'm doing by my my own buoyancy okay honorable mentions ducks easy great floaters um otters when they lay on their back and float yep. very cute those are fat guys for sure yeah um lily pads Bring True. joy. Yep. Looking at a nice lily pad with sometimes a little flower. Mm. Those are good at floating. I didn't prepare any beyond my top three. Oh, okay. Um, I, I would say continental tectonic plates <laughs> for being a less dense plate than oceanic plates. Wow. That gives us land. Someone's getting into their um, geology. The earth floating around space. That's important. Is that technically a float? Well, yeah, let's round up and say yes. Is you float in space, right? Is that the terminology? I know the analogy that they use for gravity is like, imagine a giant blanket spread out and then rolling out like different, like a, like a marble or like a bowling ball. So the heavier the object is, the more other objects around it will get sucked down into it. But hmm. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll say floating. Okay. Sweet. Cool. <clears throat> Bubbles. Bubbles. When they float, they look great. World-class floaters. Okay, I'm done. Five-star review. You guys are the best. This is from Emily Galusha. Five stars. Backpacker Radio has gotten me through some of the darkest times of my life. I can confidently say that without this podcast, I would not be planning to hike the Colorado Trail this summer. Every episode is a new laugh, a new inspirational story, and usually a new hilarious poop story. Also, Zach, 
Because of the podcast with Dr. Freeborn Mondello, I was able to reach out to him and get a new outlook and recovery plan for my overuse injury caused by my long, hard days as a dog groomer. And Chaunce, I also have an Aussie and get excited every time you talk about Harper. I think her and my dog Canyon would be besties. Anyway, you guys rock. I look forward to every Monday because of you. Keep up the great work. Love that. I like making someone look forward to a Monday. Yeah. That's a high praise compliment. Mondays need some help. Yeah. For sure. Uh, Hebrew Man's podcast also comes out on Monday. Not that we need the competition, but <clears throat> um, but another shout out to Freeborn, a pal of mine slash ours. Uh, I had a really fucked up shoulder a couple years ago and I did some PT with him and all the exercises he gave me were perfect. Actually, I was prescribed a different PT and I gave him the plan that that PT gave me and he laughed because he thought of how bad it was. So mm-hmm. he gave me a revised PT plan and it was perfect. Sticker code. Give us your best horse fact. I was kind of. I was literally thinking the same Easy. thing. Yeah. Um, and, and and I'll open this up, right? Give us your best horse fact, but I'll also accept creativity as long as it's horse related. For example, if you were to want to like pick at something that's not necessarily a horse fact, but maybe you're going to give us like a ranking of your horse girl movies. Open game. Yeah. I accept. Anything horse related. We'll yeah. Round up. Fun fact. Do you remember the horse fact that either we found on the internet or somebody gave us and we repeated it on the podcast that horses can smell, smell electri- electricity? Yeah. yeah. I was going to ask her if that was true. It's not. I asked of her. Of course it's true. <laughs> I asked her before we started and she's like, hmm, I haven't heard that one. And then I Googled it. And the the real answer was somewhere approximate to that. Like they can sense electricity, but it's not necessarily that they smell it. Most horses will smell it, get a shock on the nose and then leave it alone. Okay, that's about electric fences. <laughs> I was having trouble getting that as a concrete fact. So the person who sent that, or if somebody also knows this to be true, please give us your source because we've been having trouble locking it. Newrider.com in. says, yes, horses can sense electricity even if there isn't a noise with it. Are they The hairs around their mouths are very sensitive, and it is believed that they pick it up. Yeah. Um, so we'll say it's true-ish. Backyardchickens.com. <laughs> I don't know. I'm gonna I'm gonna leave it out there. I'm not ready. I'm not ready to dispel this. Is that a word? Dispel. I'm not ready to dispel this myth yet. Yeah. Um. I accept. What was the one I was really wrong about? I accept the baby rattlesnake venom mishap. That was a Patreon episode. Oh, we, which we forgot to plug. I guess we should clarify this for listeners. Then apparently, baby rattlesnakes are not more venomous when they bite than a regular rattlesnake. That's a myth. Yep. Who knew? Um, I'm going to stick to my guns on this. Kay. I know we were just with a horse expert for <laughs> hours. I feel like horses can smell electricity. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll override the horse expert and just use our random horse knowledge. Very good. <clears throat> um, I'm going to read the Chuck Norris Award winners, but I'm using the Patreon site, so it might not be congruent with what we have in our notes. Alex and Misty with Navigators Crafting, Andrew, Austin McDaniel, for Austin Ford, Brad and Blair from 13 Adventures, Brent Stenberg, Brian. At one point, I think we had a full name there, but maybe not. Just Brian. Uh, Christopher Marshburn, coach for Marion Outdoors. Dane. Ish. Derek Cook. We have an email forthcoming from him, I think. Uh, DoGoodPantry.org. Eric Casper. The Friendly Ghost. Eric Hoffman. Greg McDaniel. May he bring honor to his name. Liz Seeger. Matt Sukup. Mike Poizel, Patrick C. and Cialo, Sawyer Products, Spam, Timothy Hahn, Solo, Tracy Trigger. Thanks. And let me jump back to the notes. You can follow us on social at Backpacker Radio on Instagram and TikTok. You can follow us on X at Backpacker Pod, Facebook.com slash Backpacker Radio. You can follow Chance. You can find me on Instagram at Juliana underscore Chauncey, and you can get my book Hiking from Home, a long distance hiking guide for family and friends on Amazon. Subscribe and follow us anywhere you consume podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or the rest. Um, We do a dedicated episode to our Patreon supporters on the first Wednesday of every month. September's episode was a deep dive into our Pooping in the Woods project. We were going through and vetting some of the stories that we had received. You get to see sort of our process in terms of what we think of the stories, how we would craft the book at large, how we would organize things what else I thought it was really good because we kind of like you were saying went through a bunch of different options that aren't 
at the forefront of your mind for just a collection of stories. Like there were parts where we were like, okay, that could be a good spot to put a little module that talks about this leave no trace principle, or this could be a great spot to put like a diagram of, you know, different methods of pooping styles. Um, there were little categories that started to show themselves versus stories where someone's either walking up to someone pooping and surprised or vice versa. We've got a pretty dense animal centric category. Um, we've now got circle shit and cult category. Yep. So just fun stuff where we're starting to realize that and put that together and be like, oh, would, wouldn't it be cool to do this? Wouldn't it be cool to start each with an illustration where you're kind of getting to see the actual thought process at a point where if you were to send us an email and be like, I thought this was a great idea, that idea sucked, we could actually take it into consideration. Um, and I think that's kind of cool. Yeah. And you get a peek inside the mind of two very prolific through hiking writers. Yeah. Authors. Super prolific. <laughs> Uh, be sure to follow us on YouTube. Hi, YouTube. Hi, YouTube. We're doing video podcasts today. This is another in-studio guest, a very fun, lively interview. And that is it for today's show. Thank you so much for listening, and happy hiking. Bye. A little bit of a delay there. Yeah. Sorry. Garrett asked if I wanted a burger. Do you want one? I do. From where? The, the grill that they're about to put the burgers oh, on. Nice. I don't want to be skipped. Yeah. Okay. That's Bye. It.